I'll ask Carrie to uh, please take roll. <laughs> okay, so they can hear you. <laughs> Chair Brooks. Oh, we didn't know because she's like, why? Vice Chair Ariscotta. Here. Regent Boylan. Regent Brager. Here. Regent Brown. Regent Carvalho. Here. Regent Cruz Crawford. Here. Regent Del Carlo. Here. Regent Downs. Here. Regent Goodman. Here. Regent McMichael. Here. Regent Perkins. Here. Regent Tarkanian. Here. You have a quorum present. Thank you, Carrie. I'll ask uh, Regent McMichael to please lead us in the pledge. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Um, certainly, this is going to be a, a, a great day as we are having new regents um, being sworn in and given an oath from a justice who I believe is right now getting his. Oh, he is, he is there. Fantastic. Um, so I wanted to make just a, a quick thank you to um, Rosalie Bordelove for being here um, to support us with OML. And certainly, I want to thank Supreme Court Justice Ron Paragary for being here to provide the oath to the new regents. Um, and sir, what I'd like to do is invite you up at this time uh, to, to do that oath. Can you hear? I guess you can all hear me. <laughs> so let me uh, have you do this. Let's have all the uh, our uh, OTHs stand up. Okay, is this all of us? Okay, what I'm going to have you do is raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. Do you solemnly swear that I will support, protect, and defend the Constitution and Government of the United States and the Constitution and Government of the State of Nevada against all enemies, whether domestic or foreign, and that I will bear true faith, allegiance and loyalty to the same. Any ordinance? Resolution or law of any state notwithstanding, and that I will well and faithfully perform all the duties of the office of a regent of the Nevada system of higher education on which I'm about to enter. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you, Justice Perry-Gary. We really appreciate that. Uh, what I'd like to do is now we're going to take a 15-minute break. So we'll be back here at 920. This is to uh, provide some afford time for those who have just been sworn in to take some photos and um, uh, maybe take some photos with, with, our, our, with, uh, <laughs> with Justice Perry-Gary. Okay, so we'll be back here at 920. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and, and, and reconvene this meeting as of now. Thank you very much. Um, uh, item agenda number four, I'm sorry. Yeah, item agenda number four. It's fantastic that, uh, again, we have Chief Deputy Attorney General Rosalie Bordelov, who will guide us through um, part of our, our OML ethics and other considerations. Thank you for being here. I think I have the mic on there. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rosalie Bordelov. I'm chief of the boards and open government division. So um, we house the open meeting law enforcement unit within the attorney general's office. Um, and that's why I'm here today to give you some training on Nevada's open meeting law as you are a public body. Let's see if I got. So um, I'm going to keep this to um, a fair 
overview of the law along with a little bit on ethics regarding disclosures and abstentions required under Nevada ethics law. Um, there are always um, nuances and sometimes nitpicky requirements regarding agendas. If you're ever, feel free to jump in with any questions if you have them as I go. Um, if you're ever unsure, you have legal counsel as well as our office represents you as well and can answer questions um, when they come up if you have them regarding the open meeting law and um, ethics as well. So to start with, um, Nevada's open meeting law is housed in NRS chapter 241. Uh, the OML requires that public bodies take their actions openly and that their deliberations be conducted openly. This is the stated um, intent by the legislature and it, it guides the interpretation of the law by both the Attorney General's office and by the courts. Um, so for the OML to apply, you first need to be a public body which um, there's a pretty detailed definition of the term public body contained in the OML, but generally public bodies are created by statute, executive order, or by action of another public body. Um, so you were created, um, I believe in the Nevada constitution, and um, uh, at, at, which makes you a public body. Subcommittees um, and even potentially governing boards of some corporations can be public bodies as well if they meet the creation requirements in the open meeting law. Um, for your purposes, that means subcommittees of the board um, and some of the nonprofit organizations um, that you create if they meet those creation requirements. If you're ever unsure, consult with your legal counsel um, and they can do a more detailed analysis on any particular body and whether they need to comply with the open meeting law. Um, there are some general exceptions to this mandate a few of which I'll discuss, they exist all over the uh, Nevada revised statutes in various places, so I definitely will not be giving an exhaustive review of those. Um, but the Nevada Supreme Court has stated that the spirit and policy behind the open meeting law favors open meetings and any exceptions thereto um, should be strictly construed. So uh, it, it really, that, that intent that I mentioned in the last slide is really guides um, the interpretation of the law in favor of the public having a view of government. So once you know your public body, the next step is it has to be a meeting because not every single conversation or gathering of members of a public body is subject to the open meeting law. To have a meeting, you need a quorum of the public body plus deliberation or action. So a quorum means a simple majority of the total body or another proportion established by law. Um, uh, for you, I believe that is still a simple majority. Um, I think you may have a quorum statute, but it, it comports with the same. And to deliberate means to collectively to examine, weigh, and reflect upon the reasons for or against an action. So that's really sharing your opinions, um, getting guiding towards that deci ultimate decision of how you want to vote. Um, that's what deliberation is. And so even if you don't take a vote, a deliberate, deliberation amongst a quorum can constitute a meeting. And I'll get a little bit into what um, ways that that can be more problematic outside of a formal setting where you're all sitting together and speaking um, in a bit of later slides. And then action means a majority vote of members present. That's action under the open meeting law, because you are an entirely elected body, uh, action requires a majority vote of all members, regardless of how many are present at the time of the vote. Um, there is an exception to that under the ethics law, which I'll talk about towards the end when you have recusals. Do you have a question? Oh, you're almost looking. <laughs> you did it. I wanted to make sure I addressed. Um, so... A gathering of a quorum at a meeting such as you have today, where you've called roll, you know you have a quorum here, we know this is a meeting, you're in public. However, where problems can occur um, and you could mistakenly violate the OML, and that's where I, I try and focus on because those are the areas you're most likely to run into where you're not intending to have a quorum conversation, but it occurs. So if you have a quorum together at a social function at, I'm sure there are many functions that occur um, within the university system that a quorum of you may be present. There could be professional functions, other types of events. So long as there is no deliberation or action, 
you're covered on the open meeting law. So my recommendation usually to any boards that I represent is if you're gathered and you're not at a meeting, don't talk shop. And by that, I mean, do not talk amongst yourselves regarding items within your jurisdiction and control, items in which you might make a decision. That doesn't mean you can't talk to your constituents. You can't talk to other people about those topics because that that's intended. But you want to make sure you avoid talking about those topics with a quorum of your body, because that's when you have a problem. Um, that's taking that deliberation outside of the public eye. There are exceptions. Um, the biggest exception there would be the attorney-client conference. This is an exception to the definition of a meeting, which means if you are meeting, even as a quorum, with your attorney regarding existing or potential litigation, you can receive advice from the attorney, ask questions. You can even deliberate regarding um, that litigation, regarding potential actions you may take about the litigation. And that is a complete exception to the definition of a meeting, which means it does not have to be noticed. It does not have to be recorded. Minutes don't have to be kept. Um, it doesn't mean you can't have it as uh, at times are called executive sessions or closed session. Um, I caution against the use of the term closed session because it is used within the open meeting law um, for other purposes that are part of a meeting. Um, so my recommendation is you can always put it on the agenda. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with the public knowing you're going to talk with your counsel. But my recommendation is labeling it as a litigation session, an attorney-client session, or something of the sort so it's clear what's happening. Regent Boylan. Thank you, sir. Uh, I wanted to catch you here so I don't forget when you're finished, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Now, it says here, electronic communication between a quorum of members can constitute a meeting. Does constitute or doesn't, co what does it mean can constitute? So the reason why it can is it can if it rises to the point where it's deliberation between a quorum. So the reason why that example in there, that email pitfall of reply all, um, I frequently recommend that um, if staff or members are going to send out an email to all other members, informing them of something, sending out supporting materials, whatever that, that email may be, that they BCC all members so that the members can't click reply all and give their comments. Because what you're trying to avoid is an email conversation that all mem or a quorum of members are on and emails are going back and forth. So even if you're not having a contemporaneous, and that's where I'll get into kind of that's that serial communications, a contemporaneous conversation, if the full conversation, including deliberation, those opinions of what you want to do, how you may want to take action, um, reaches a quorum collectively, then you have what's called a constructive quorum, which can violate the law because that would meet the definition of a meeting because a quorum deliberated on a topic. So electronic communications, whether those be emails, text messages, you know, other type of messaging, phone calls, whatever it is, um, if it's between two members, you're fine, or, or less than a quorum, you're okay. Um, the serial communications issue is when you have, um, for example, say you have a seven-member body, so four is a quorum. Three members email or have a phone call together where they talk about an issue, and they're less than a quorum, so it's fine. They talk about how they want to vote, what they want to do about it. doesn't really matter. They're less than a quorum. They're safe. But then one of those three members goes and calls up another member and says, hey, I was talking with these others. This is what we were talking about. This is what we were planning to do. This is kind of what they thought. What do you think? You've now deliberated collectively between four people, which in that case, in the seven member body is a quorum. I know for you, for you it requires more. Um, but that's what that serial communications or quote walking quorums can be. And that's something that I really caution against be, it often that's going to reach there mistakenly. You don't often have a board who has a telephone tree and intentionally tries and gets evading the law by by talking amongst themselves in less than quorums. But I really try and emphasize that in my trainings because that's that's where well-meaning members of a public body could end up violating the law. Um, yes. 
sorry. Uh, so does that mean if we don't deliberate anything in an email, I just want to say good morning to all my fellow OTs and previous members. We're not deliberating, so I can just send them all an email mm -hmm. saying good morning, everybody? Yeah, you could send everybody an email that says good morning, and they could respond good morning back. And you've deliberated over, haven't deliberated over we anything, so that's fine. Okay. You could talk about the weather. That's not within your jurisdiction control. Um, that'd be fine, too. Frequently, emails will go out regarding scheduling. When's everybody available for a meeting? That's that's not really something that is going to trigger problems with the law. Um, it's, though, like I said, that deliberation about something within your jurisdiction. And it has to be a back and forth to meet the deliberation requirement. So if you, if some article or some issue came up mm -hmm. and you thought it was really relevant to something with the board yeah. and you emailed it to every board member and said, I want you to take a look at this article. I, I think this is something we should look into. Good. And nobody responds. Instead, it gets put on an agenda for a future meeting and you all talk about it during the meeting. Well, then you're you're safe. That's fine. Because there was no deliberation behind the scenes. There was a little bit of information pushed out. That article you sent would be supporting material. But uh, the deliberation then occurred during the meeting. So that's kind of why I say I, I asked for that BCC because then nobody can click reply all and there's no back and forth. I so see. a one-way communication once isn't going to violate the law. But then if you have somebody else emailing back or responding, oh, well, I think this, maybe we should do this, and then somebody else and that's where you can reach okay. a problem. Okay, that's great. I wanted to know that that helps because well, we as a board are really nice because we never reply to anybody's email to each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're, we're good there. But we could send out one email to everybody. I, that, and one more question, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, if you don't mind. I, I keep seeing this thing. Uh, well, what's it called? Uh, lawyer uh, client privilege. Mm -hmm. We keep getting letters from... Jimmy and others, mm -hmm. in my mind, or I'm not asking from anybody else's, uh, I've had experience with some lawyers. Uh, my, in my mind, the client's uh, lawyer privilege, what do you call it? The counsel privilege? The attorney-client privilege, uh, yes. Attorney, that's the word. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lord. Now, that means that the, uh, the attorney cannot share that information with anybody because the client... I mean, I can tell you that, yeah, I shot so-and-so and I shot him. I can go and tell somebody else. The attorney can't do it, right? So in the attorney-client privilege, I, I feel, and I think some others on this board feel, that's used like a club over our heads. Don't you share this? Don't you talk to... It's up to the client to tell anybody they like, what they like. Whether they're fools or not, that's a different thing. Mm -hmm. Am I right about that? How does that work, that attorney-client privilege. It's, the attorney is not supposed to tell anyone, yes? Uh, so, Jimmy Martinez, for the record, this is something I'll, I'll discuss a little bit in my presentation later today, um, but it's, awesome. it is different in this scenario because, as I'll get into later, the client is actually the organization, mm -hmm. and the organization acts through its duly authorized constituents. So a waiver of attorney-client privilege actually requires an action of the board, or the board to authorize a regent to waive when they deem appropriate under certain circumstances. But it would still take an action of the board for that privilege to be waived. Um, and that's all addressed in the bylaws, but I will get into the details of that later today. You will. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, okay. Mr. Chair. Appreciate sure. it. So, and, yeah, uh, I was essentially going to say that, that the client is, as a whole, can only give client consent to waive a privilege or something of the sort as a collective, which is via action during a meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Crawford has a question. Cruz Crawford, for the record, thank you so much for your expertise. Um, my question is, we would, uh, I would, um, really like to work on some of the interpersonal relationships of the board, and some of that includes maybe going out to lunch or not forced fun, but maybe we like to go bowling and have nothing to do with um, any agenda items. Would that be allowable? Uh, yes, because you're not talking about the agenda items. Like I said, it's that deliberation. Now, if you're less than a quorum, you're, that's really less worrisome. I mean, if you met one-on-one -on -one with every single region, that would be fine. And what you talked about, 
you you could deliberate on anything. However, my major caution would be cross communication between those meetings, so that you're not telling one region what another said, and then it's re and that's that serial communications issue. And so that's that's the caution and the worry. But if you um, aren't talking about agenda items or things within your jurisdiction and control, it's just getting to know each other, then you're not deliberating on anything and it doesn't really matter whether you're a quorum or not. The only slight caution I'll give just because I see every complaint that comes through our office is when you have a quorum of a public body together out in the public gathering and spending a lot of time together outside of a meeting, it sometimes asks for a complaint, even if there's nothing wrong going on. It doesn't mean you will have, it doesn't mean you're violating the law, but I have gotten frequent complaints against um, some bodies when they, for example, after having their meeting, the entire body and staff goes out to dinner together. And the intent behind that is simply them getting to know each other. They just finished a bunch of work and we won't find a violation if we have no evidence that there was anything deliberated upon. But the view to the public often, it, like I said, it asks for the complaint that you then have to, your, your counsel's then going to have to respond to. Um, and so that's just one issue. It's something you may have to fight. It doesn't mean you violated the law if you don't deliberate. Um, but there's kind of the line, the line between not violating and violating. And then where I ask my clients to be, which is farther on that side, so they don't get the complaint in the first place. But Okay, so don't talk <laughs> shop, don't gossip don't talk afterwards. Shop, right. And Sometimes we get more from spending time together than um, not spending time together and yeah, having it's, that concern. It's, yeah. it's, that's a perception thing. Um, it's really, like I said, if you're not violating the law, you're not. So there's not going, if you didn't, if you didn't deliberate, there's not going to be evidence of deliberation. And so you're not going to get a violation. It's just something to consider. Um, Thank you. I think the cost versus the reward of that is we don't want something hanging over our head to the point where we're not able to have these interpersonal relationships. Right. So I think it's beneficial That's to, kind of to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, Regent Brown has a question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Regent Brown, for the record. I was going to hold my question, but then when you were answering uh, Regent Crawford's uh, question, you brought up agendized items and jurisdiction. And so I wanted to get the, the clarification of <clears throat> no deliberation and action about agendized items or anything that we have jurisdiction over. So in other words, if I have a question about something that we technically have jurisdiction or we have jurisdiction over, but it has not been agendized, it's not on any upcoming uh, meeting, could we not discuss it as a group or because I... Where I would often stop, because sometimes these discussions happen during meetings, too, where something's not on the agenda, but somebody brings it up as a potential future item, some, something is brought up during public comment. It's that line between discussion and deliberation, right? Discussing the issue at all, I'd prefer that these things happen during a meeting, even if it's not agendized, just because it's extra public and you just... Walking into the deliberation, it, it's not a fine line. But where I will stop a body that I'm representing if that's starting to occur during a meeting and it's not on the agenda, because as I'll get to kind of later, you can't deliberate on an item not on your agenda during the meeting, um, is deliberations when you start walking towards a decision, right? You're starting to say, okay, it's one thing to say, this issue has come up. I think we need to do something about it. And somebody else says, yeah, you're right. Here's part of the problem and kind of that. But then when it starts saying, okay, what are we going to do about it? And then starting to offer those solutions, that's where I think it usually is when I will stop a body and say, hey, I think you need to put this on a future agenda um, and, and have that conversation once it's been properly noticed. So the deliberation for a meeting encompasses anything within your jurisdiction and control, um, not just something on a published agenda. Um, during the meeting, the purpose of the agenda is it allows you to have that deliberation, right? You agendize, you properly notice, so the public knows if they want to come and watch or pink public comment. And then that's the avenue for getting to have that thorough deliberative discussion and take action if you need to take action. Any other questions before that kind of conversation, I think, took care of the last couple bullet points on this one as well. 
Um, so moving on to kind of how do you comply? We, we've talked with some of these things, but the biggest is um, the meeting notice and agenda. How you comply, you hold your meetings, which, which you guys do regularly with your quarter meeting, quarterly meetings and occasional special meetings to try and get all these things out in the open. Um, meeting notice and agenda must include the time, place, and location um, of the meeting or information on the remote technology system. I will note that portion doesn't entirely apply to you because you are required to have a physical location as an elected body. Um, the name, contact, and business address for an individual from whom supporting material can be requested, um, clear and complete statements of the topic scheduled to be considered. That's the area where we get the most complaints regarding agendas. Um, and there's some other requirements. Your staff is more aware and also knows they can contact us and legal counsel when it comes to posting these agendas. So I don't get into as many minutia in some of these trainings for members. Um, but the biggest one I wanna point out is that clear and complete statement of the topic scheduled to be considered. Um, a higher degree of specificity is required for agenda items of substantial public interest um, in order to meet this standard. And basically what that means is, it's kind of a common sense standard. You usually know when you have a real controversial issue coming up. You have a lot of public reaching out to you. Your constituents are reaching out to you, talking to you about it. A lot of public showing up at the meeting, making public comment. That's kind of how you know that this is a topic of substantial public interest. That's when you need to make sure the agenda item is very clear as to what potential action could be taken, what's going to be talked about. Um, if it's something, if it's approval of funds to spend, um, ranges or caps, I often recommend having something on there so the public's aware what, if it's a contract, what kind of money are we talking? Are we talking building a billion, building for many millions of dollars, or are we talking a contract for somebody to simply do a bit of a needs assessment and you're going to spend a few thousand dollars on it? I mean, it, it really varies what it is. Um, and I always recommend the more detail, the better. However, I will note there are times when I purposely keep agenda items a little bit more general to allow for larger discussion. Um, because if you can be, if you're too specific, sometimes you pigeonhole yourself into what action you're able to take. So it, it's a bit of a balancing act, um, on those controversial items. That's usually where your council has a hand in drafting the agenda item to make sure you're where you're kind of where you want to be. Um, and for the agenda posting, there's a lot of requirements, although it changed in 2021, so it's a little, little bit less burdensome. You now need to post the agenda physically at the office, the principal office of the public body, um, the public body's website, if it maintains one, and Nevada's notice website, which is notice.nv.gov. So if you want to participate a lot in government, every public body in the state of Nevada has to post their agendas to notice.nv.gov. And you can go to that website and take a look and see today's meetings and get a link to every single agenda for a meeting occurring of a public body in Nevada. Um, the po additional posting is always recommended. I mean, post where you think the people, your, your public wants to see it. That's what I usually recommend. If you are a public body that you're, you know, you have students who are, interested in what's going on. So perhaps posting at some of the student unions, others can be recommended, but the minimum requirement is those three locations. And all of this posting has to occur no later than 9 a.m. of the third working day prior to the meeting. Um, and I try and make sure members are aware of that posting deadline because the posting is occurring at other places. That usually means staff has to have the agenda ready to go the day before. So that fourth working day and with holidays in there, that can sometimes stretch to a week. Um, and I just make want to make sure members usually are cognizant of that deadline because it's a pretty hard deadline. And beyond that, there really isn't any fudge room to add agenda items or, or change the location or time of the meeting. You can sometimes delay a meeting to later um, and you can remove agenda items at any time, but adding is really what usually comes up. And uh, one other caution I guess I'll give on some of the agenda items is it's with that clear and complete statement is we usually give a bit of a caution to items like member comments and reports. Those aren't bad. They're frequently on agendas. They're frequently on agendas of bodies I represent all the time. But the caution is just when you have those items, they're kind of a, a news report, basically. They're, they're the individual presenting can discuss 
present information. This is what's been going on, you know, that kind of thing. And they can be really valuable, but you, again, you can discuss a little bit, but that's where you then, it's kind of like the future items item. You know, it's, you, you can talk about issues a little bit, but then the ending result, unless you have more detailed items is let's put this on a future agenda to talk about more fully because they're fairly general items. So some additional requirements um, to the law just to be aware of, um, though most of your staff and council is usually dotting these I's and crossing these T's as they go through. Um, but public bodies need to make reasonable efforts to assist and accommodate persons with physical disabilities desiring to attend a meeting. An additional notice is required for the consideration of a person's character, misconduct, competence, or to take administrative action against a person. This notice can, in the case of certified mail, be as long as 21 working days. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. Casual tangential references to a person or to something that's happened aren't going to reach that consideration of character. Um, but as this board's seen sometimes in the past with employment actions and things of the sort, those really do get there. Um, the notice is considered waivable. An employee or whoever it is that you're going to be discussing, if they want their item heard, um, you can get a waiver of them of the notice, but that's important to, to be aware of. Also, meetings must be recorded or transcribed with minutes kept in conformance with NRS chapter, it, with 241.035 contains some specific requirements regarding minutes. Um, and the recording or transcribing option, um, audio recording is probably what you guys do the most. The recording of your meetings are always public records and must be available to our office if there's a complaint and to the public upon request. Um, and supporting material. There is a specific definition in the law of supporting material, but it's essentially any material that's been given to a quorum of members of the body um, relating to an item on a posted agenda that um, a reasonable person would take into consideration um, when deciding on that agenda item. Um, it can be kind of broad. Uh, and the while that definition that was added in 2019 can be helpful in terms of limiting a little bit what's considered supporting material, not every single document that's been pushed out to a quorum of the board is supporting material. Something that was given to the board a couple months before the meeting could become supporting material at the point that an agenda item has gone, been posted that relates to it. And now you're going to talk about it at a meeting. So it's kind of, if you're sending out, like I said, that, that in the example of a member sending out an article, it's not supporting material at that time, even though the member sends it out and says, I think this is interesting. I think this is relevant for you all to read. And everybody reads it. A quorum has it. It's not yet supporting material. However, somebody else then says, you know what? You're right. This is something we should talk about. Let's put it on our next agenda. I want to talk about it. At the point that agenda is posted, that article has now become supporting material. Um, so what I ask is that if those things are going to be sent out that you think may reach that point, is that you make sure your staff's aware of it. Um, because they are usually who's putting together that, that packet um, of supporting material that is available, a copy at the meeting, available to public upon request. They're putting together your board books, and it kind of allows them to keep that organization so that you're protected. And then a point to um, emergency meetings. Prior to the pandemic, they were very, very rare. <laughs> then we had a lot. Um, an emergency meeting may be called where the need to act upon a matter is truly unforeseen and circumstances dictate immediate action is required. So that usually it, it really needs to be something, we're talking natural disasters or a pandemic, something affecting the health and safety of the public um, that's truly unforeseen and you need, and then you can have a meeting on two hours notice. You can have, you, you need to comply with as many of the old Mel's requirements as you can, but the three working day notice is usually what you can't comply with in an emergency. And that's fine. But if you have one hour's notice, still try and post an agenda and get it out there to as many people as you can, but you can go ahead and hold the meeting. Um, you can only act on matters related to that emergency. So you can't say, well, we have to have an emergency meeting. Let's throw everything else out there that we had we were had pending. You kind of need to limit it to that. Um, but it also means the emergency is how you already had a meeting scheduled tomorrow. 
and you properly noticed that meeting, but something came up and so you want to add an agenda item. You could do that as well, but it needs to meet those emergency qualifications to, to get you out of that noticing requirement. Um, so public comment. This is the other area where we get the most complaints. Um, and there are a lot of requirements kind of surrounding it, but this is, they're designed to protect free speech because you are creating a limited public forum when you um, hold one of these meetings and have open public comment periods. There are two options for public comment to comply with the law. The first is the most common, which you will see, um, I think, on the, to the agenda for this meeting, as well as most of your agendas. It is having a public comment period at the very beginning of the meeting. This can be general or this can be limited to items on the agenda. And then having another one before, right before the, at the end of the meeting. It does not have to be the absolute last item, but it needs to be prior to adjournment um, and can, can't be combined with that first one. The actual language of the statutes is simply another period prior to adjournment of the meeting, but it needs to be not combined in with that first so that public has kind of there are two opportunities, one to comment on agenda items and one opportunity to comment generally. Um, and the other option is to, instead of that first co public comment period, you can have um, public comment on every single action item after discussion of the item, but prior to the vote. Um, and you can do that instead of that general. You still need to have the, instead of that, that first period, you still need to have the general at the end. Um, I often just recommend doing that two period that almost all bodies do, which is that first period at the beginning, you can limit it to agenda items if you want, general at the end. If you would like to add additional public comment during the meeting, you will never violate the law by adding, adding periods of public comment. There, you don't need to agendize additional periods. If you allow the public to speak extra times, that's within the intent of the law, that's fine. Only caution is the restrictions area. Any restrictions on public comment must be reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. You cannot restrict based on viewpoint. So any added public comment periods in the middle of the meeting, just make sure that they are also fair public comment periods, that you're not restricting based on viewpoint. You say, you know what, we have a lot of people who actually want to talk about this item. Let's bring them up now, but give everybody the same amount of time, regardless of how, you know, what their opinions are. Um, Excuse me, and thank you very much. Uh, Vice Chair Arascata has a question for you. Like today's meeting, there was, is there a requirement or is there a time frame that a continuing meeting for the public speaking, for the public speak, is there a time frame in which can elapse between meeting dates? So if we had a meeting yesterday and this is a continuous meeting, if we had it, let's say on Monday, would it be the same time frame, the same requirement? I've never had that situation come up. My thought would be that it would, as long as the original agenda lists each meeting date and when it will be continued to, so it is clear to the public when their opportunities to speak will be, um, then I think you'd probably be okay. But I've only ever seen continued meetings on more than one day when you have it like this one, where it's, here it is, it's going to continue to day two or three, um, continuing agenda as needed, and the ones where there's a gap it's because something didn't finish and then the date's not, it's to be determined and is scheduled at a later date. And at that point, that's a new meeting because you need to have that initial agenda that lists the possible dates, lists the continuing so that it's clear to the public what those opportunities are going to be. But today's meeting was posted and the clarity was right there. Yes, today's meeting was posted as it's with, with two dates, start times for each day, and that it was a continuing agenda that was going through. So it was recessed at the end of yesterday and continued to today. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Regent Boylan has a question. Yes. Thank you, Chair. This, this is awesome. I'm, I'm learning a lot. Now, about public comment, when there's a, a written, written public comments, are they supposed to be read out during the meeting? So or is that something that, hey, someone's written it and it's not public? It's up to the body. So. There's no requirement in the law that written public <coughs> comments be accepted as pure written comment. There's a requirement that if a speaker Perfect. makes public comment and has prepared written remarks and requests that those be included in the minutes, you need to attach those to the minutes. 
But um, there is no requirement. We do even have an opinion right. out there that mm -hmm. if a public body isn't re accepting written comments mm -hmm. and a person sends something in and does not appear to speak, simply sends in the written, it doesn't have to be attached to the minutes if you don't want. Now, again, the same time, place, manner restrictions are what you can apply. So I recommend having a policy of either we accept them or we don't. If we do accept them, this is how we do. This is when you need to submit by. They'll be attached to the minutes or they'll be sent. Um, I have a lot of bodies that have a deadline for written comments that are, is a day before the meeting or something of the sort. Um, so that they can be transmitted. And sometimes they'll say, we'll accept them after, but we don't guarantee that the members will have them by the meeting um, because there's logistics that go into there. And since the OML does not have a requirement that a public body accept written comment, um, they, now that's, there are other requirements for written comments on certain items of things elsewhere in NRS, especially with administrative regulations and things of the sort, but just under the OML, there isn't that requirement. So it's up to the public body how they want to do it. My recommendation is that an agenda public comment statement describe all the ways public comment can be made, if there's deadlines, what that is. So when you say it's up to the body, now, do we put that in our wee little handbook? That that's part of our, who, who decides that? The um, body, I've never heard about that from this body before. So how do we make that decision? Do we vote on it? Do we have a retreat and discuss, not deliberate? If you're going to make that decision as a group, that would need to be voted on at a meeting. Public comment restrictions are often given the discretion of the chair of the body for the meeting. Um, you know, and that's generally how case law and others is. The moderator of a meeting is who gets to make these decisions. Um, like I said, my recommendations to most bodies, though, is if you can discuss it as a group, because because the chair changes once a year for this for this body and for many bodies, it, they they have new elections annually, biannually, different times, um, or I guess semi annually is the term. Um, my recommendation for consistency and clarity for the public is that you're able to discuss this and come up with a, a longer term policy. However, as far as the law is concerned, it could change frequently. I would just ask that the, the restrictions and the abilities be on the agenda. Thank you, ma'am. Um, and the last bullet point on there is the OML does not prevent the removal of a person who willfully disrupts a meeting to the extent that its orderly conduct is made impractical. And I like to point to chairs when I do this one because I ask that you read that language carefully that is specifically quoted out of the law. And if you're going to remove a person, which is usually at the discretion of the chair, um, I often ask that you even put that language on the record <laughs> as why because it, it's strict as to why, and you're often asking for a complaint if you're kicking somebody out of the meeting. However, the OML permits it. Um, usually when I've seen somebody removed from meetings, I, I've seen it happen, um, and I've received it on complaints where we found no violations for it happening. It's usually because somebody is shouting, making a commotion outside of public comment periods. I often recommend that a chair warn them ahead of time but they're continuing to do it and it's disrupting the meeting. And at that point, you can request that they be removed from the meeting. That's about your only option. If you've got somebody that's a problem public in there is at the point that they become willfully disruptive, you can have them leave the meeting. And that's about all you can do. Like I said, I often request a, a warning or something to them of please, I'm, we're gonna need you to quiet down and, and only speak during public comment periods. Um, if you continue this behavior, we're gonna need to have you remove the meeting so we can Keep functioning. Regent Alcala. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a question on public comment, and I got a text from someone that's watching, and they wanted to know why we didn't have public comment this morning. I think it's because we recessed yesterday. We didn't adjourn, mm -hmm. and we'll have public comment at the end of the meeting. Is that correct? Yes, that is okay. that is what, and that I think leads to the same question we had for today's meeting. Yeah. Because it was agendized as a two-day meeting with a continuing agenda, public comment periods were held at the beginning of the meeting and will be held again at the end. Okay, thank you. So I mentioned before closed sessions. Um, there, there are other areas of NRS where potentially closed sessions could be held, but the where they're noted in the OML is... If the public body is going to consider the character, alleged misconduct, professional competence, or physical or mental health of a person, they may 
go into closed session to have that discussion. Now, um, there's exceptions. The appointment of a member to the public body or consideration of the chief officer of the public body or agency or similar position, those cannot be in public and other, or sorry, in private. And otherwise, um, it's permissive. So the public body can offer it, but the individual being discussed can elect that the discussion happen in public and the public body can choose to have it in public. Neither party can force it to go into closed session and either party can force it to stay in open session. So it's important to kind of note that area. Um, where I see that the most usually has to do with um, licensing applications or things of the sort where, where you're going to talk specifically about a person and their qualifications. And usually in a licensing application, the reason that it didn't get through staff and it's in front of the board is because there's prior discipline or there's credit issues, something that came up in a background check. So that can be discussed. You can go into closed session to discuss it, discuss it. But closed session, and that's why I wanted to make that different from your attorney client session. Closed session is still part of the meeting. It still needs to be recorded. There still have to be minutes. You need to be able to separate that recording in minutes because they are not generally available to the public in the same way until the confidentiality has been waived or changed and there's some provisions in the law about it. But they are still part of the meeting. And any action has to happen back in open session so the public knows what's happening. So you could go into closed session, have some of that discussion, get information from the individual about, you know, whatever it was in that background check, get your questions answered, and then you need to come back into open session and use the licensing example, approve the license or reject it or whatever the board's going to do. Regent Perkins. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a quick question. I was the exceptions considered the chief officer. Are our presidents under that chief officer umbrella or is it specifically restricted to? I would want to look more into their positions to be sure. And I don't know if Jimmy wants to answer that if he's done that analysis so far, but I have not. Are they? Okay, then. <laughs> now, Jim and Martinez, for the record, the bylaws do state the presidents are officers. Okay. So there you go. Um, so also virtual attendance. I'm sure many of you have seen sometimes some of your members are attending virtually. Um, that needs to happen sometimes. That's been permitted under the law since 2013 or 15. I'm not sure when the law changed. It's been permitted long before our pandemic. You could have virtual attendance. Um, they're always... Prior to um, AB 253 is kind of in 2021 when some of that changed and we had Directive 6 going on during the pandemic. But virtual attendance by members was permitted prior to that. Um, you just needed to have, and an what continues for you as an elected body is you need to have at least one physical location in the state of Nevada where public can attend and participate and make public comment. Um, members may attend virtually but uh, the public needs to be able to see the same thing the members see. So you, we could, you couldn't have all of you in one room together uh, on camera and then video conference to another room where the public is. That you couldn't do because you're able to see each other, see facial expressions, see things that the public can't see. Um, the virtual attendance basically needs to be um, like what you've done here in the past. If somebody's, if, if you've got members attending from home, they're showing up on the screens here and the people here can see them to the same way the people from, you know, virtually can see each other and what the public from the audience can see. Um, and the little pitfall I put in there that I note is if you may have a quorum of you attending virtually or otherwise able to view the virtual, I ask that the chat function be disabled if possible or otherwise just not used because that's part of the meeting. And so if you're ending, making comments or discussing anything via the chat function, it has to be recorded, it has to be visible to the public, and it can just cause problems. It is not a per se violation of the law, but it, it has a lot of areas where it could easily walk into a violation without meaning to. So my recommendation usually is just don't use the chat function if you're in a public meeting attending via some of the virtual um, technology. So before I get into, I guess, any other questions on that, and then I'll give a bit of what happens if a violation occurs and how those are addressed. Okay. Um, so any action taken in violation of the OML is void. And that can be a little difficult to the extent that if you don't believe you violated, you are unaware of a violation, 
Um, there is a 60-day statute of limitations for anyone who was denied a right by the law or the attorney general's office can file an action in court to have something declared void. It's a short statute of limitations. So the public body is permitted to still act on that, even if um, it, it's potentially a void. Now, there's other areas where that could create problems, such as some litigation decisions and the sort, but... Um, the way, uh, that's why I say that's, it's somewhat of a problematic statute and just generally saying things are void, but, but that is something to, if some, if some action was taken outside of a meeting entirely, that's a real big one to say that action didn't happen, right? That wasn't an action. That doesn't meet the definition of action. It didn't occur. Um, when it comes to complaints, anyone can file a complaint with the attorney general's office um, regarding a violation of the open meeting law. And the Attorney General's office has jurisdiction to investigate and prosecute violations of the OML. Um, our process usually is we get a complaint. If it states a claim, we'll reach out to the public body, um, get a response, watch the meeting, gather whatever, interview people, gather whatever we need in our investigation to reach a decision. And then we will either issue a no violation letter or findings of fact and conclusions of law if we find a violation. If we do find a violation, the public body must agendize and acknowledge that violation. They don't have to agree with it, um, but they do need to include it in their supporting material. So um, it's public in that way. Also, any complaint filed with our office is a public record. Um, corrective action is recommended if you think there's something that may have occurred in violation. And so what I would say where that happens the most is a public body goes forward and finds out after a meeting that something they took action on, the agenda item was written incorrectly. It didn't list somebody's name. It had something wrong in it. And so they weren't intending to violate. There was a mistake in the agenda items and they took action on this item, but it wasn't adequately noticed to the public. Even if you haven't gotten a complaint, my recommendation would be to agendize it in a future meeting is for possible corrective action. Go ahead and redo it because two things will help you there. It may not completely negate any prior violation. Perhaps a person wasn't noticed adequately and you took action regarding them. Redo it with the proper notice. But um, the new action is valid. Regardless of whether the old action violated, the new action, if done correctly, is, is valid and you can move forward with it. Um, and so that's why I often would recommend, even in an abundance of caution at some times, doing it. The other would be, if our office gets a complaint, and it looks like there probably was a violation, but it also looks like the public body's already agendized or already redone corrective action. We're not going to go to court to avoid anything. And we're also going to know that this has already been corrected in any opinion we issue. Um, and so it can help a lot in that way. Um, the only note is if you are taking uh, corrective action, you need to redo the entire agenda item. By that, I mean new deliberative process. You can't just rubber stamp what you did before. You need to, to rediscuss it and put it on the record and treat it as if it didn't happen. So then moving on kind of from the open meeting law into a little bit under the ethics law regarding disclosure and abstentions. Um, disclosure, and this is under chapter 281A actually, we're out of chapter 241 now. Nevada ethics and government law is chapter 281A. And I believe you'll be getting a more thorough training on this a little, in a little while from the Ethics Commission, uh, maybe in a month or two. But uh, disclosure and abstention is what comes up during meetings the most. And disclosure is mandatory for any interest created by a gift or loan, a substantial pecuniary interest, a commitment in a private capacity, or the representation of a prior, uh, private client. And those are the same areas for when abstention could be required. It's just a, you could have a minor interest that's not really going to affect your judgment, and then you just make a disclosure, but you can go ahead and participate. If that interest or gift um, or commitment in private capacity rises to the level that the, um, a reasonable person's judgment would be materially affected by whatever that is, then the ethics law requires you abstain from the vote. Um, if you're going to make a disclosure or abstention, uh, it needs to happen at the time the matter is called before it's discussed. 
Um, and, and many of you have probably made that. I'm just going to disclose, right? I have a professional relationship or had a professional relationship with this person in the past, and I don't think it'll affect my judgment today. And then you go on. Um, the disclosure needs to be sufficient to inform the public of the nature and scope of whatever the conflict is. Um, and then the benefit to that that can be as well is that last bullet point on the right is the quorum reduction. If you need to abstain because of the ethics law, you are reduced from the quorum requirement and treated as if you're not a member of the body um, for purposes of that vote. And that, But you do need to appear and make the disclosure and abstain, and then you can get that reduction. That usually is only an issue, especially with larger bodies like yours, if you have a lot of people, if you have an issue that you're going to have a lot of people abstaining on. Because one or two... You guys don't meet that often when you do meet. You have enough of you here that probably, even if that person just wasn't here, you have enough for quorum and to be able to take action. And um, I would definitely say that if you were ever unsure at all or just want to be extra careful, consult your counsel regarding whether or not you need to make a disclosure or abstain because there is a safe harbor in the ethics law that will protect you from uh, many of the penalties if you relied in good faith on the advice of counsel when acting. Um, so I definitely always recommend giving your counsel a call. You can describe, you know, this is what it is. This is what the relationship is. Do I need to? And they can also help you with language to make sure that your disclosure is sufficient if you're making a disclosure. Um, and I think it kind of wraps up what I have. I put some links in here. I don't know if you guys have access at all to the... Um, electronic version of this to click on those. But the first one there has to do is um, you can also access by Googling uh, attorney general uh, open government training. We have about, many aren't all relevant to you, but we have a number of videos, training videos that are about an hour each. Um, one links is an ethics training from the ethics commission. Um, we have one on open meeting law. These were all done in fall of 2021 after session, so include updates from the 2021 session. Um, there's one in there on public records that would be relevant as well, if any of you would like to view those on your own time. Um, they're slightly more in-depth training than some of what we've had today. Um, there's also all of our open meeting law opinions are public. Um, that second link there is where you can find any opinion from the Attorney General's office going back I want to say almost 20 years. We go back pretty far out there, although I will note they're not searchable, so it can be a little difficult. So if you do have a question, you can ask your counsel. You can also reach out to me. I'm happy to answer any open meeting law questions. And I have some other indexes and ways to search those opinions that might be helpful. Um, and the last link there is our open meeting law manual. It's a little bit out of date, but it, it is searchable and can be helpful if you're just trying to look at some of the general issues under the law, um, like I said, it hasn't been updated in a number of years. So um, if it has to do with some of the virtual meetings or things that might be more recent, it can't hurt to check with counsel or myself to see if anything's changed. But it does have some useful information. And with that, does anyone have any other questions? Regent Borland. Uh, Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Um, uh, that's great. As I said before, I like it. I don't know if I'm, I can ask this question, or I should ask this question, but it's got to do with uh, our open meetings. And when it comes to new business information, mm -hmm. um, we, I, we have number six. It's about new business information, our uh, agenda item number six. And in there, it says that no substantive discussion may occur at this meeting on new business items. And it states NRS 241.010. Now okay. help me with this, because what I found on NRS 241.010 states that all public bodies exist to aid in the conduct of the people's business. It is the intent of the law that the actions be taken openly and their deliberations are conducted openly. It doesn't say anywhere to me that we cannot discuss new business. When so, we get into new business, why can't we discuss it? I don't find it. Maybe I'm looking in the wrong Well, so I can do two <coughs> things. One is this essentially gets to what I'm saying between Excuse discussion me. and deliberation. 
this item is intended because it doesn't list what any of those specific items are. You can't deliberate on them because the public doesn't know what they're going to be. So it's kind of that bring up items that we should talk about in the future and we'll get them on a future <coughs> agenda. Some discussion can occur during that, but I you see. don't want to walk into deliberation. The other I would say, if you want to look for a better, it would probably be 241.020. And that's where the agenda item requirements, probably subsection three, though I don't have it right in front of me Let me real quick. I could give you a more specific site in terms of where, but basically it's that clear and complete standard because this item is not a clear and complete statement of um, any specific topics. So you can't get into a lot of depth because they weren't noticed to the public. So 241.0203, um, where is that one? D1, pretty much, or D in general, 3D, um, if that helps. That describes that the agenda must, uh, consists of a clear and complete statement of the topic scheduled to be considered during the meeting um, and a list describing which items are action items um, and denoting them as four possible actions. So it, in terms of a site in of where specifically, it's that clear and complete standard is because new business is saying you can suggest new items, which means you can bring them up, you can talk about them, but you guys can't deliberate or, or start walking towards action on them because the topics haven't been listed. So but I think the intent of the item is that you can bring up those and then they get added to a future agenda with more detail. Thank you. But a real quick question, uh, uh, Chair. Uh, so we can discuss them, but we cannot deliberate. Correct. But we act as though we can't even say a word about them out here because it's like, oh, it's a new item. You can't discuss it. Because but we can discuss it. Right? You can discuss a little. It's just really hard to find where that line is because I'll be honest, the definition of deliberation includes the word discuss. So <laughs> it's... It's awesome. It, it's, it's not the most the clear area to say the difference between deliberation and discussion. I, to read you the exact deliberation definition, it says it means collectively to examine, weigh, and reflect upon the reasons for or against the action. The term includes without limitation the collective discussion or exchange of facts preliminary to the ultimate decision. So where I will often stop a body if they're getting into this on new topics is if you're talking about what the problem is <clears throat> that you want to discuss more fully, that's fine. It's when you start getting towards the suggestions of what to do about it or potential reasons to do one, somebody suggests, I think we should do this thing. And others could say, yes, this is why that thing may be needed. But if you really start getting into, yeah, here's why we should do it, that's deliberation because that's getting towards, and, and the worry is you all discuss, here's why we should do this thing. And then at the next meeting, when it's properly agendized for action, everybody says, yeah, that thing we talked about, let's vote on it. And the public has no idea why. And that's kind of, because that deliberation already occurred. But so, it occurred when it wasn't agenda. Yeah, so, so that's that's oh. the worry, and it's it's a hard line to find. And so that's so when it comes to staff and others asking you to keep it pretty limited, it's because again, the line between violation and no violation is here, and they kind of want you to be a little farther over just so we don't accidentally cross it without meaning to. And and that's why we have Jimmy, uh, uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> Council Martinez, with <laughs> us. So we, you can stop us right then. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Thank you for clarifying that. Regent Del Carlo has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, I get um, that things have to be posted ahead of time by the you know, three days and all that. And very frequently, we get supplemental material mm -hmm. closer to the meeting, which is fine, and it's posted for the public. So then we're in a meeting, and the chair reads something that none of us have a copy of, mm -hmm. reads it. So is that a, a violation or not? I personally thought it was at the time. Because it's, we never did get it ahead of time, but it got mm -hmm. right into the record. So can you clarify so that? You're handy, the public has to be able to have access to what you have access to, essentially. So there isn't a requirement on, because there's no requirement that supporting material exists. The requirement is that if there is supporting material that was given to everybody, the public also has access to it. So to the extent that somebody reads something, but no one else has it, the public's present at that meeting and they heard it read too. So they've got the same thing you have. So you don't have a violation there. If it's handed out at the meeting, if it says like, I got this here, I'll email it all to you guys. And it's emailed. And all of a sudden you now all have it. Somebody needs to go print a copy. You kind of, I, I, I honestly would recommend a break. So somebody prints a copy and there's a copy available to the public. 
um, in terms of posting online, because you're not required to necessarily post online in some circumstances, it, it, it's rare circumstances when you are, um, it can get posted the next day online or something like that, and you'll be okay. But for the public present, there has to be at least a copy they can view. And so our recommendation always has been if something's passed out. Now, granted, if somebody's going to pass some, a handout, usually you know ahead of time. So our usual request is, hey, just bring an extra copy for the public or an extra couple or somebody on the board will say, I don't need mine, I'll share, you know. And so you have something for the public. But the public essentially needs the same access that the board members have to that information. Okay, but it wasn't published. It wasn't printed out and passed out. It was just read. Right. So, so as long as it's read. It. So right. As long as it's read aloud and the public heard what you heard. It's okay. You don't have a violation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for this entire brief. The, the, are there any other regents that have a, a question? If not, uh, again, thank you very much for your time and for being here. What I'd like to do is take a break. We'll, we'll, we'll come back at 1030 and begin the next section on, on this agenda. Thank you. Move on to the next agenda item, which is agenda number 4B, Parliamentary Procedure and Robert's Rules of Order. And I believe with... Sorry about that. With us via Zoom is uh, Connie DeFord, who is a professional registered parliamentarian who will lead us on procedures and Robert's rules of order. Are you there, ma'am? I am. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much um, for... for... Go ahead, ma'am. That's all right. I was just going to express my appreciation for uh, obtaining the opportunity to speak to you today and for the documents that I was provided ahead of time, and for the ability to listen in on the presentation regarding the Nevada Open Meeting Act. Um, my background is in municipal government, and so I was well aware of the Open Meetings Act within my own state of Michigan, and I know that each state's uh, law is a little bit different, so it was very interesting for me to hear that presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for providing us this guidance. I, I would like to um, let you know that we, we do have regents uh, who are with us who have come from the north and are an, on a traveling schedule. And so it, I would appreciate it if we could stay within the parameters of, of the 60 minutes that's allotted, as close to that as we can. Um, that would be beneficial for those regents who are, are catching a flight after this meeting today. I will do my best. Thank you, and we're we're ready when you are. Okay, and uh, my understanding is that the slides will be advanced for me. So I would need the next slide, please. So during this session this ap afternoon for me, morning for you, uh, we will be talking about some basic rules, um, governing documents, and how uh, that their hierarchy works how to handle a motion, um, committee work, and some commonly misunderstood motions. I will offer an opportunity after each section for questions. Uh, so if you have questions, please uh, make sure that you um, get the attention of your chair so that uh, that question can be addressed. And if it's going to be something I'm going to cover later in the session, I will let you know that. So. With that, we'll proceed. And again, we're going to cover some basic rules about parliamentary procedure. Next slide. Parliamentary procedure is used by all types of decision-making organizations, including governmental, as you well know. And it really facilitates decision making in a fair, consistent manner. The most common parliamentary authority is Robert's Rules of Order. And the current issue is Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised 12th edition. Your bylaws provide in section 14 that the uh, latest edition of Robert's Rules of Order will govern in every instance where it does not conflict with your bylaws or the Open Meeting Act. So this presentation is based on your governing authority. Next slide. Parliamentary procedure is based on rights. 
um, the rights of the majority. And we, we've heard, or uh, you may have heard the phrase, majority rules. And in most instances, that's correct. It takes a majority vote. In your instance, it takes a majority of the members, not just a majority of the members present, in order to make arrive at a decision. Um, we want to protect the rights of the minority. And your Open Meeting Act does that very well by providing that everyone gets notice, including the public, and that the minority has certain rights um, in order to be heard, to vote, to express their opinion. You as individual members have rights, and those rights can't be infringed upon. We're going to talk about those on the next slide. Absentees. We want to make sure that if someone is not present, they have been provided the agenda, the background material, and subsequently the minutes of, of the actions that were actually taken. And then, of course, all of these together. Next slide. So with rights come responsibilities. So you as a member of the Board of Regents have the right to attend meetings. Uh, we kind of forget about that being a right of membership because you are a public body. But I am a member of the Rotary Club, and as such, I can attend Rotary meetings wherever they occur around the world. However, if I want to attend some other service club meeting, I have to be invited. I don't have that right to attend. So that right of attendance at a meeting is a right of membership. You have the right to receive the agenda and, of course, the background information. You have the right to make motions as a member of the board. You have the right to speak in debate or discussion or deliberate. You have the right to vote. And you have the right to nominate someone to hold an office, such as the chair. Or, and you also have that right to hold that office. Those are all your rights as an individual member of the Board of Regents. You also have duties. With rights come duties. You have the duty to attend meetings, and you have that opportunity both to be in person and to attend virtually. So it's important that since you are elected to serve in that this capacity, that you do attend the meeting and um, that you obey the rules. That is, you know the rules, you know what is in the um, your bylaws and You've had now a session on open meetings. Um, I understand you're going to be hearing about an ethics session, all kinds of areas that you're going to be provided with um, training. Insist on enforcement of the rules, not to the point of being just picky about everything, but making sure that no one is being defrauded of their rights. And to further the object of the organization, you have a, may have a mission or a vision statement. Um, I'm a member of the National Association of Parliamentarians. One of the objects of our organization is to provide training um, for regarding parliamentary procedure. So by my serving you today, I'm also furthering the object of my own organization to provide parliamentary training and also to fulfill your assigned duties until properly excused. Next slide. The thing to remember is that the organization is paramount as compared to the individual. As an individual, I have the right to propose an action, to propose a solution to what may be a problem. But it's the organization itself that has priority. What is decided at the organ by the organization uh, is more important and takes a priority over what I would like as an individual. And as a member of the board, what those, those decisions are, are supported by all of the board members. Even though it may not be exactly what you wanted, it is the decision of the board itself, the organization. Next slide. You have to remember that all members are equal. No one gets two votes. I've, I've yet to find that organization where someone gets that second vote. But all members are equal. And a quorum must be present to take valid action. We know that a quorum is the majority of your membership. You have 13 members. 
a majority is seven, and your bylaws do prescribe that it, a quorum is seven members. Um, so that is important to know that you make sure that you have a legal meeting. Next slide. What can you do in the absence of a quorum? Well, Robert says you can do four things. Connie says you can farm. I kind of like mnemonics. They help me remember things. So you can fix the time to which to adjourn. You can set a time and day to continue that meeting to another day and time, so long as notice is properly given and it's any time before your next regularly scheduled meeting. It's like taking a really long recess. You could simply adjourn the meeting. We're not going to have a quorum. Nothing can be done in the absence of a quorum, so we will adjourn the meeting. You could take a recess, take a short break. Perhaps someone will join the meeting virtually, or maybe someone has been delayed in getting to the actual location of the meeting. Or you could take measures to obtain a quorum. Um, usually now that is texting or phoning someone to see if, if they're going to make the meeting. Um, living in Michigan, we do have snowstorms. We had a situation where um, we needed a member to have a quorum in order to sell bonds uh, for a project. And so his, actually his street had not been plowed of the snow. And so we sent a snow plow out. We actually took um, a different kind of measure in order to ensure that we had a quorum to take care of that business. So if you remember the FARM, that's fine. If you slide the T over, makes a different mnemonic. If you remember that, that's okay. But I prefer the FARM acronym. So next slide, please. Thank you. And before we continue on to that next slide, Regent Perkins has a question for you. Uh, thank you, sure. Mr. Chair. Um, since we're talking about the absent, absence of a quorum, um, does that only does that apply to like information only items also, or does it only apply to the actions that we are, the things that are for action or possible action? It does apply to action. You can hear other things, but my guess is if you're going to hear items uh, that don't require action, you're going to hear them again when you actually have the meeting with a quorum. So in uh, my opinion, it's, um, it's kind of a waste of everyone's time to go through items that aren't going, that you're going to have to hear eventually again. Is that helpful? That was uh, the end of her question, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so only one main proposition can be under consideration. So only one main idea, one proposal, um, but and um, we can do a lot of things to that main idea. We can amend it, we can postpone it, we can send it to a committee. All kinds of things can be done, but we're still only doing with that one main idea. And only one member can have the floor at a time. So um, there, there must be a some kind of a system whereby the presiding officer, uh, the chair, uh, can determine who will be the next speaker. And that is the responsibility of the chair to, make, to determine the order of speakers. And um, But only one member can have the floor at a time. So if it's raising hand or saying, um, Mr. or Madam uh, Chair, whatever the case might be, everyone should be aware of how they need to get the attention of the chair in order to speak um, to a debatable motion. Next slide, please. Full debate is allowed on all questions unless the rules don't allow debate. Here's the rule. You never debate anything about debate. Anything about a debate is undebatable. So if the motion is to close debate, stop debate, it's not debatable. If the motion is to extend debate, it's not debatable. If the motion is to limit debate, it's undebatable. Debate is a is a um, one of those items that um, is a right of membership, 
And if you're going to infringe on that, it's going to take something more than a majority vote to eliminate. So without any debate, it's going to take a two thirds vote. Next slide, please. A majority vote decides unless a greater percentage is required, as I just indicated. For you, a majority vote is a majority of the members. It's not simply a majority of those present in voting. So if you have 11 members and the vote is six to five, which is a majority of those present in voting, it is not a majority act uh, for your organization. Uh, you need to have seven votes in order to take action. So two thirds is a little bit different. Two thirds is at least twice as many in favor as are opposed. So if you have a vote of eight to five, eight is not at least twice as many as five. So you still don't have two thirds. You need to have nine votes in the affirmative to have a two thirds vote to apply to a requirement for that two thirds vote, such as closing debate. So it's um, not greater percent, that greater percentage is usually two thirds. And it is also identified in your bylaws. If you're going to change the bylaws, a two thirds vote is required and that is a nine, nine, nine votes requirement. And um, finally, silence gives consent. Um, if there is a question by the chair saying, if there's no objection, the amendment will be approved and everyone is quiet. That silence gives consent. You acquiesce to whatever is being said. So you really need to pay attention to what is being stated by the chair to make sure that that silence uh, is what you intended. I'm not talking about abstentions at this point. It's just that um I'm talking about some general consent item, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Next slide. Is there any uh, question about what has just been provided? If not, we'll go forward with this next slide. Regent Goodman has a question. Thank you. Thank you, I'm sorry, I, I missed that. Did you say that six is not a majority? Six is not a majority vote. You need seven affirmative votes in order to approve something. Okay, when, when you were talking about 11. Under Robert, well, yeah, for, okay. our, for our board of 13, Under, I understand that yes. seven is the majority, but you were talking about 11 and, and it was five and six. I just Let's say that there were only 11 members present. Sure. And the vote was six to five. It did not pass because you have a I requirement see. Perfect. That there are that you have to have seven affirmative votes. Always okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, next slide, please. There is a hierarchy of rules. Um, obviously, we must comply with federal law and state law. You've just heard today about the open meeting law. Um, there are the ethics um, disclosure regarding. Um, um, pecuniary interest in, in proposed action, um, all of those things take priority over your own bylaws. But your bylaws take priority over what's in Robert's Rules of Order. And they're very specific that that's true. Special Rules of Order are items that change how meetings are handled. Um, and for you, one of those is your requirement of seven votes, although it's in your bylaws. It really is a special rule of order that you must have seven affirmative votes in order to approve something. That's not what it says in Robert's Rules of Order, but your bylaws and that special rule of order contained within your bylaws takes priority over what's in the parliamentary authority. Next slide, please. And we're going to talk about actually handling a motion, which is how business is conducted within your meeting. Next slide, please. 
So there are some steps in handling emotion. First of all, you must be recognized by the chair. You have to obtain the floor, uh, be recognized by the chair, and then you offer emotion by saying the words, I move that or I move to. Or if it's a resolution, resolve that. So the effective words are I move. It is an I motion or I'd like to move or I think we should or maybe we ought to. It's I move. And personally, I had a problem with that verbiage because um, I wasn't moving anywhere. I was standing in place or sitting in place. I wasn't moving. But like much of parliamentary procedure, this comes from the English Parliament. And in the English Parliament, they have a side table with all the proposed legislation that may come up before them. And when someone said, I move, they would physically move that item of business from the side table to the main table for consideration. So that's where the verbiage comes from, I move. Um, I move that or I move to. Uh, the difference between a resolution and a motion is that a resolution is a motion in writing and then replaces the words resolve, I move with resolve. So, and it may have a preamble, um, you know, the, the clauses where it says, whereas this and whereas that, uh, be, what I like to call the because clauses, because of this and because of that and because of something else. Now, therefore, be it resolved, this is what we do. But a um, resolution is a motion usually in writing with or without a preamble. Next slide. The next step is that another member seconds the motion by saying second, or I second the motion. Um, in some areas of the, of the country, they, they um, like to say that they agree to the motion, but you do not have to be in agreement to second the motion. I can be adamantly opposed to the motion and still say second, because the purpose of a second is to allow the chairperson, the, the presiding officer, to know that more than one person thinks it's important enough to handle that item of business. So that's the purpose of a second. What happens if, if you require a second and there is no second? The chair should ask, is there a second? And if there's silence, the chair should say, I've heard the chair say, the motion dies for lack of support. Well, I contend the motion never lived because it's that second that gives it life. It's an, the second is the second person who also thinks this is important enough to discuss and vote on. So the better thing for the chair to say would be, since there is no second, the motion will not be considered. That's much clearer uh, than some inanimate or object um, died. So. Again, if there's no second, um, there is no second and the motion will not be considered and then move on to the next time of business. Next slide, please. Then the chair states the question, repeats it. It is moved and seconded and then repeats the entire motion. When I made the motion, when I said I moved, that was my motion. When it was seconded, it was still my motion. When it is stated by the chair, it doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to the entire group. It is now the, the uh, property of the association or the organization, not of me personally. So it's very important that the chair does state the question because that places it before the group for further discussion. Next slide, please. And then the members debate or deliberate toward making a decision. Um, you must first be, seek recognition and obtain the floor. Again, that's the responsibility of the presiding officer to determine who is going to speak next. There are some rules for debate. Next slide, please. 
So the maker of the motion is entitled to speak first. So it only makes sense that if I offered the motion, I must think that it should be approved. And so then I would want to speak about it. I don't have to speak first, but if I wish to speak, I have that right of priority in speaking. No one can speak more than twice to the same question on the same day uh, in large organizations. Um, I'm going to talk a little later about how you handle your business um, as basically a small board. Um, but um, this is the general rule that no one can speak more than twice to the same debatable question on the same day. No member is entitled to speak a second time while any other member wishes to make a first speech. This kind of goes back to kindergarten. You know, no one got to go down the slide a second time until every child in line got to go down the first time. There were no cuts. You went back to the end of the line before you could get in line again. So you don't get to speak that second time until every member who wishes to make a first speech has had that opportunity to do so. And then according to Roberts, every having obtained the floor, you have the right to speak and debate for 10 minutes. That's a really long time. Um, most people do not uh, take um, uh, advantage of that lengthy time to speak and debate. Um, but under Roberts' general large bodies, um, that is the limitation. And uh, rights and debate are not transferable. So I can't yield my time to someone else. And it isn't like we see on C-SPAN where they yield to the person from the great state of Nevada um, in order to speak next. Um, that Those rights are not transferable. Next slide, please. Remarks are supposed to be confined to the merits of the pending question. So whatever that motion is, that's what you talk about. Um, we have to, again, play nice. Members' motives are not to be attacked. All remarks are to be addressed to or through the chair. So if you, um, and members aren't supposed to speak directly to one another. So it would be through the chair. Could the former speaker please explain? Through the chair. Could the finance director please provide us with uh, information on this line item? Through the chair. Always to or through the chair. And of course, no member may comment adversely on any prior act that's not pending. Um, nothing like, well, if they hadn't done something so dumb in the past, we wouldn't be in this mess. That might be the case, but you don't verbalize it. Next slide, please. Then the chair, after debate is concluded, the chair puts the question, that is, takes the vote. The question is on the adoption of the motion, that, and then repeats the motion. If it's by voice, viva voce, the chair said, those in favor say aye, those opposed say no. The important thing is for the chair always to tell the members what to say or how they wish to vote. Uh, it is not appropriate to say those in favor say aye, those opposed nothing, or same sign. If I'm opposed, I don't want to say aye, I want to say no. So make sure that if you're chairing uh, the uh, Board of Regents or a committee meeting, that you allow the members uh, that opportunity to vote by knowing what they're supposed to say uh, to verbalize that vote. Next slide. There are various methods of voting. With what I've just explained was viva voce, by the voice. Um, there might be a show of hands in a small group setting. Um, actually, show of hands is how uh, the normal method of voting in Canada. Um, there might be a rising vote in a large assembly um, when we have the um, ACCT uh, Senate meeting uh, where we may be uh, voting on change in bylaws. There would be a rising vote. So there's a visual. Uh, if it looks to be close, we may count that vote. In most instances, um, in your setting, you probably might also use a roll call vote where every person's name is called uh, and then you expressed your vote. Um, and then um, usually ballot votes are not allowed in governmental settings. 
There may be unanimous or general consent where the chair said, if there's no objection, this is what's going to happen. And, and then that silence gives consent. I've explained majority vote is more than half. And in your case, more than half of the members. Um, a plurality vote is how we handle primary elections in our country. So if there are two or more candidates, more than two candidates, it's the individual who receives the most votes, not necessarily a majority of the vote. And if that's the case, we're going, you're going to have to have um, uh, that included in the bylaws in order for, for a plurality vote to elect. Um, Two-thirds vote, again, twice as many people in favor as, a, as opposed. A tie vote is a lost vote because it did not receive a majority vote. And then a vote by acclamation is, um, again, something that would be uh, required in the bylaws so that uh, if there are no more candidates than positions to be filled, um, that the chair can declare that the those candidates were elected by acclamation. And again, that's something that needs to be included within the bylaws. Next slide, please. So the final aspect is that the chair announces the result of the vote by saying which side has it, whether that means it was adopted or lost, the effect of the vote, and where applicable, the announcement of the next item of business would be the ayes have it, the motion is adopted, and we will do whatever was proposed, or the noes have it, the motion is lost, and we will not do what was proposed in the motion. And then the announcement of the next item of business. So next slide, please. Let's count how many times we should have heard the motion. Number one, we heard it when the member made the motion. I move. Um, not when it was seconded, but when the chair stated it, it is moved and seconded and then restated the motion. That's two. Members debated. And then when the chair takes the vote, the chair says, the question is on the adoption of the motion to repeats that motion for the third time. And then the chair announces the result. I have it, the motion is, and we will or we will not do this. So you should, if it's handled properly, hear that motion four times. So there should never be a question about what was it that we approve? Uh, and every member then knows exactly what has taken place. And at this point, I'll stop for any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Del Carlo has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this presentation is really good, Connie, and I've, this is the third time I've heard it, and I learn something yeah. every time. And um, But we're not good about what we just talked about, restating the motion, the chair states the motion, say the four times. I mean, in my six years, none of the chairs I've worked with was just probably, I don't know, five or six. So I know one of our presidents went to another state, and their agenda, they print the motion on the agenda. Now, do you recommend doing something like that? Or do we just need to, as chairs, when we have that opportunity, just get better at doing it properly? Because, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times we've been in these meetings and everybody goes, kind of looks at each other like, what are we voting on? Are you, I, and well, so many times we have to raise our hand and say, could you please restate the motion? Because we're not really sure. So I think this is an area that our board could really improve on. This is something that is common um, with the problem you're experiencing. Um, it, it just seems almost redundant to say it over and over again. But just as you explained, you get confused. You'd get a lot of discussion and now what, are we, what is it that we're voting on? It is one of the duties of the chair to make sure that people know what is being discussed and what is being voted on. Uh, if you can get into the habit of doing this, um, I, I once attended a session done by Henry Robert, one of the authors of the book and uh, grandson of the original Henry Robert. And he said that in, in chairing a meeting, if you get used to doing that, it will be second nature. You don't have to think about it. 
Um, regarding the um, putting the motion on the agenda, um, I actually did that in our community uh, for items where it was, um, we used a consent calendar. So where people, it was pretty commonplace, we, things that were not uh, controversial and the motion then would be there and then the mo number would make that motion and the chair could easily repeat it. Um, if it's a, um, a lengthy motion that's made, the chair or the secretary can request that it be made in writing uh, so that the chair has the, the verbiage uh, for that motion uh, and states it correctly each time. Uh, it also then goes to the um, person writing the minutes so that it is exactly the way it should be. Um, but I can't express enough how important it is for the chair to do that repetition so that members are not confused and don't have to ask uh, what they're voting on. And I know it's not done routinely, but um, I'm guessing that for the short time it takes to do that, uh, it would greatly improve people's understanding of what's going on within the meeting. Thank you. That was very helpful. Are there any further questions? If not, we'll move on. We'll talk a little bit about committees. Next slide, please. There are basically three types of committees, standing committees, special committees, and committee as a whole and its uh, derivatives. Next slide, please. So standing committees are constituted to perform a continuing function. Like you always have that committee. They remain in existence permanently or for the life of the assembly that established them. You have um, some uh, standing committees listed in your bylaws. You also have the right to, as an organization, to um, form additional standing committees if you choose to. But once those standing committees are formed, they are of a continuing nature. Nature, You always will have that standing committee. You members usually serve for a term corresponding to the officers or until their successors have been chosen. And a new body of committee members normally appointed at the beginning of each administration. Next slide, please. So you have... In your bylaws, eight standing committees listed. Each committee is composed of three to six members. Um, the chair, the vice chair, and members of the committee are appointed by the Board of Regents chair. So the duty of that committee is to consider and make recommendations to the board upon matters referred to it. So once a matter is referred to a committee, then you have that duty to report back to the Board of Regents uh, your findings. So, and should you the need arise upon recommendation from the committee, the board could appoint a public member as advisory without vote to that standing committee. And I'm sure that all of you are appointed to some standing committees. You have 13 members and um, eight standing committees. So you probably may serve on more than one. Next slide, please. Special committees, on the other hand, are appointed for a specific purpose as the need arises. So they, they carry out that specified certain task and at the completion, that is when they present their final report, they cease to exist. Um, they're only there to handle that one specific item. The thing to remember is that you can't appoint a special committee to perform a task that falls under the assigned function of an existing standing committee. So if you have a standing committee that handles that type of business, you can't appoint a special committee to, um, to do that instead. Again, the chair, vice chair, and members are appointed by the Board of Regents chair, and the bylaws, your bylaws, provide for a fixed term of one year or less. So those special committees are um, pretty quick 
um, no more than about a year um, to do their business. Next slide, please. So committee as a whole and alternate forms. So Robert's um, list the committee as a whole and its alternate forms of quasi committee of the whole as if in committee of the whole and informal considerations. What this does is it provides the opportunity for the full assembly to give detailed consideration to a matter under conditions of freedom, somewhat like a committee. Um, in this structure, any member may speak and debate on the main question or any amendment for the same length of time as allowed by the assembly's rules, as often as you can obtain the floor. So if you want, if you can obtain the floor three, four, five times, you talk about it. That's the purpose of a committee. The committee's purpose is to really delve deeply into the ramifications, the pros and cons of what, um, what is being proposed and how it might affect the entire organization. So again, though, under these rules of debate, you, you can't speak another time so long as any members not spoken the first time. So it's the same, that same rule applies, but you can speak more than just the twice as normally uh, would be allowed under Robert's Rules of Order in a large assembly. Next slide, please. So a committee of the whole, um, your bylaws um, state that from the board from time to time may elect to make any of the standing committees a committee of the whole. That is not what this is. Um, that would be a, a committee consisting of all of the members. But a committee of the whole would be within your regular meeting, um, but it's suited to a large assemblies, more than about 100. Um, results of votes taken are not final decisions. The, the, um, they're only recommendations. So the chair is appointed, not your regular presiding officer, um, theoretically to be in a better position to preside effectively during final consideration. So the, uh, what would happen is the um, entire group would deliberate. Um, those rules of debate would be relaxed. And then they would rise and make a final report basically to themselves, not as a committee. So the committee of the whole would make a recommendation to the entire um, organized assembly. And then that assembly would take under consideration that recommendation. That's a committee of the whole. Robert says more than about 100 members. Next slide, please. I keep wanting to do that. So a quasi-committee of the whole is as if in a committee of the whole. And Robert says it's suited to meetings of medium size, 50 to 100. So again, the results of votes taken are not final decisions. They're only recommendations. They rise and report. The difference is that the presiding officer remains in the chair and presides, and then they take a final vote on that recommendation under their regular rules. Next slide, please. So um, in your size, it would be informal consideration suited to small meetings of ordinary societies. Yeah. What it does, it simply removes the normal limitations on the number of times a member may speak in debate. Um, presiding officer remains in the chair and presides and results of vote during informal consideration are the decisions of the assembly, which are not voted on again. Um, it, it, in your case, does not have to be used even for informal consideration because you fall under the parameters of a small board under Robert. Next slide, please. So consideration of business in committees. So in your committee meetings, staff is, gives notice of the committee meetings and keeps the meetings of the proceedings. Um, you operate in the committee under the bylaws or special rules and the parliamentary authority. Um, the committee chair, unlike in your regular meeting, is usually the most active participant in the discussions and work of the committee. Um, they do a lot of the focus work and directing the committee toward making a decision. So the formalities and modifications of the regular use of parliamentary 
procedure and small boards are applicable during the meetings of all standing and special committees. And they're also the rules for you. Roberts considers a small board not more than about a dozen, and 13 is about a dozen. So these are the rules. Because you've adopted Robert's Rules of Order, these are your rules for deliberation. Next slide, please. First, members may raise a hand to obtain the floor before making motions or speaking in debate, which they can do while seated. Roberts is very explicit that in a large assembly, members must rise, stand if it, or go to a microphone um, in order to make a motion or speak in debate. As a small board, you're sitting around, it looks like in a square area. Um, everyone can see each other. You don't have to stand up to make a motion. You can raise your hand, get the attention of the chair, um, and you can make a motion or speak in debate while you're seated. And that's how you transact your business. Second is that motions need not be seconded. Now, in observing some of your meetings and in reading your minutes, I see that you do require a second for your motions. You should somehow adopt a um, special rule of order stating that motions need to be seconded because your rules right now, because you've adopted Roberts, say motions need not be seconded. But your custom is that they do have to have a second. So the, the um, easiest thing to do would be to adopt a rule that says motions need a second in order to be considered. That simple. Um, Number three, there's no limit to the number of times a member can speak to a debatable question. So again, um, you don't have to limit it to twice, to 10 minutes each time. It can be um, three, four, five times, or not at all. It certainly is your uh, up to your discretion how many times you wish to speak in debate. Informal consideration of a subject is permitted while no motion is pending. So you have an item of business on your agenda, you can talk about it without first having a motion to approve something. Under normal parliamentary procedure, in order to discuss something, you have to have a motion first. But because you're operating as a small board, you can have discussion to kind of clarify where you want to go with this particular subject before you have um, a motion made. Next slide, please. So when a proposal is perfectly clear to all present, a vote can be taken without emotions having been introduced. So, um, but you have to agree to that by unanimous consent. That is no one objecting or the, um, or you take a vote. You can do it by show of hands initially, but at some point you do have to take a vote on it. Um, just likewise for the chairman, um, just as for the members, the chairman need not rise while putting questions to a vote. In accordance with a large assembly, the chair is standing. And if you've been in a large meeting, usually they're up on a dais or they're behind a lectern and they're so that the focus of the organization is to that presiding officer standing before them. But that's not the case in a small board. Your chairman may remain seated and um, put questions to a vote while seated. Next slide, please. Excuse me. Uh, prior to the next slide. And finally. Uh, uh, excuse, sorry. Okay. Uh, Vice Chairman Arascata has a question. Certainly. Thank you, Chair, Thank you, Chair Brooks. You were just mentioning a second ago that a second motion does not need to be conducted. But on slide number 25, he says, handling a motion, it takes those six steps. Member makes a motion. Another mo member seconds the motion. Chair states. That's the in a large group setting. Yeah. Okay. That's that is the large correct. group, and the large group is over the number. The number is over fifty or twenty-five to fifty. Roberts, the qualifier in Roberts is not more than about a dozen for a small board. So, I, if you get fifteen, that's kind of pretty close to a dozen. If you get up to twenty, 
um, like maybe the ACCT board where you got 24 or 26, they op- have to operate not as a small board. Okay. They have to follow those other rules. Okay. So then as a baker's dozen, we could go for not having the second motion. You can. Those that, quite frankly, that is the rule now because you've adopted Robert. You have a custom of requiring that second. And if you're going to continue that custom, you need to approve it as a special rule of order that would supersede what's in Robert. Excellent. Thank you for the clarification. You're welcome. Um, And finally, um, the chair may, without vacating the chair, speak in informal discussion and debate and vote on all questions. And informal discussion may be initiated by the chairman, him or herself. Uh, In a large assembly, the chair uh, does not, is not able to speak and debate without vacating the chair or, um, or vote on all questions, only in the case of a tie or where their vote would affect the result. So it's a big difference in handling items as a small board in your case. Are there any further questions about this aspect of your um, board? Next slide, please. And the next one. So some commonly misunderstood motion amendments. Uh, most common uh, subsidiary motion or motion to affect a, a, a main motion that's made is to amend. Uh, Robert says there are three ways to amend. You can insert or add words or a paragraph. You insert somewhere in the middle and you add always at the end. So if you, it's your intention to add, you don't have to say at the end. Uh, it would be to add for instance, no more than $5,000. Then that would be to add it means it always goes at the end. To strike out or to delete words or a paragraph, um, the technical term is strike out, um, but I know that delete is often used in substitution. Or to strike out and insert, to strike out some words and insert others in their place. Those are the common forms of amendment, and um, you resolve the amendment first uh, before you vote on the motion. So that that seems to be something that some organizations have a problem with, not yours in particular, Um, but you first perfect the motion, and then you vote on the motion as it was perfected or amended. Any questions on amendments? There's no question. Next on slide, thank please. You. All right, thank you. Friendly amendment. Now, I did notice in your minutes um, there were occasions where there were friendly amendments made, but they were made at the um, wrong time. So let me go back to handling that motion. When I make the motion, it's mine. When it um, seconded, it's still my motion. When it's stated by the chair, or if that statement is not made, but members are discussing it, it's too late to make a friendly amendment. People use the term friendly amendment, in air quotes, friendly, um, to make it more palatable. You know, Um, they're not going to say, I'd like to make a hostile amendment. They want to make a friendly amendment, something that is going to be agreeable. Um, if I make that friendly amendment before it's stated by the chair or before we start discussing it, now I need to have concurrence from the maker of the motion. At that point, if someone proposes a friendly amendment to me, I can say I would like to um, alter my motion to the following. I can change it at that point because it still belongs to me. Um, and let's say I agree to that change, but the person who seconded it says, 
I don't agree to that change. Well, guess what? You have a new seconder because the person who proposed that friendly amendment is going to second the motion. They propose that change. So it doesn't matter who initially seconded the motion. It matters that there is a second if you're going to follow the rules for a second. But after it's stated by the chair or after discussion has begun, it is an amendment just like any other amendment and it requires a second, if you require that second, and a majority vote for approval, not just the person who initially made the motion. If you're getting to the discussion, it's too late for just that one person to change the, the motion. It doesn't belong to that one person anymore. It belongs to the entire assembly, and therefore the entire assembly has to approve that change. Any questions about friendly uh, amendment? There is a question, Regent uh, Del Carlo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I kind of thought there might be. Thank uh, okay, you. Connie, this is another area in my six years that we are all over the board on. And what usually happens is the motion's made, it's seconded, and then we're in the heat of debate, and you're you're trying to get people like swayed to your side. So then a friendly amendment comes up, and that's how we've been doing it. So. If we're not doing it correctly, it's another thing we, as a board, we should. So are you saying then, once it becomes uh, through the chair, then if it's, a, it's an amend, um, a motion, we should just vote it down and then we can make another motion in a different way or we can't change the subject? I'm a little confused here, how we can get it. You can, you to, can amend it. You can you amend, amend it. By it. Yeah. But you can't it's amend it once it's been seconded, friendly. you said. It comes so off. Yeah. Friendly is irrelevant at this point. Friendly or hostile, it's a change. And it doesn't belong to just the person who made it to begin with. It belongs to the whole group. And so if the whole group is agreeable to that change, or a majority is agreeable to the change, then the amendment is adopted. Not just the one person. Okay, I got. Oh, that's the that's the key then. That that's the crux of the matter. Is okay. Who does that amend? Who does that motion belong to? Does it belong to the maker? And it only belongs to the maker up to the point where everybody is involved in discussing it. And if everyone is involved in discussing it, it's no longer that friendly amendment where I can modify it because I made it. It's too late for that. And now it becomes it's the property of the entire group entire group has to agree to the change or thank a majority you. of the entire group. Okay, thank you for clarification. No problem. And next slide, please. A previous question is a motion to close debate. Um, it, the maker must have the floor. It is an... It, sufficient to just kind of shout out, I call the question or question, um, that that's not how it works. The maker must have the floor. It does require a second. Again, because it's about debate, it's not debatable. And it takes a two thirds vote required for adoption because it's taking away that right of membership to speak and debate or it's qualifying it. So previous question is a motion to close debate. Next slide, please. Um, this table or to lay on the table is the most misused motion in the entire country. Um, it um, had its genesis again in the English parliament. Um, it's used to set aside pending business temporarily to take up something of immediate urgency, something more important has to be taken care of. Any condition makes it a different motion. So if it's to table until the next meeting, that's a motion to postpone. If it's a motion to um, table until you get further information, that should be either referred back to staff to place on the agenda 
when they get the information or maybe referred to a committee to investigate. Anytime that condition is attached, it makes it something different. Um, the business does remain on the table legitimately until the end of the next regularly scheduled meeting, and then it's gone completely. Um, the reciprocal motion is to take from the table. So you lay it on the table, take it from the table at the same or next meeting. So um, to table is undebatable. I noticed in minutes I saw where table was actually debated and a friendly amendment was applied to it, which I'm not sure how that worked. But tabling is not amendable. It is also not debatable. It takes a majority vote, but it the chair should ask if someone moves to table, for what purpose do you wish to table the matter? And if it's to, we need more information or we're not ready to vote or whatever, then suggest the appropriate motion, then postpone it to the next meeting or refer it back to staff or do anything else but to table. To table is to take up something of immediate urgency or more important. You know, the, like I said, started in English Parliament, you know, let's say the monarch of the day, be it king or queen, came into the chamber. This is the person who could say off of your head and did it. You know, <laughs> you don't want to keep that person waiting. Or maybe you have a consultant who charges by the six minute increment and you don't want to keep that person waiting while you talk about um, parliamentary procedure or something else. You want to get that taken care of. That's when you use the motion to table, to set it aside temporarily to take up something more important of immediate urgency. And when that urgent matter is taken care of, someone doesn't have to be the same person. Anyone can move to take it from the table, and now it's back for consideration. Any question on tabling? There are no and questions. Next Thank slide, you. please. Thank you. Uh, reconsider um, is used to consider the vote again on a question that was already decided at the same meeting. Actually, your bylaws are very explicit, and this is exactly what it says. This member must have voted on the prevailing side. In other words, yes or I if it was adopted, no or nay if it failed. And after debate, is vote is first taken on, should we reconsider the motion? It takes two votes. If we say yes, we should reconsider. It's like you wiped out the vote and now you're going to vote again. You can debate about it again, could even amend it, and then vote again. It's just some information has come forward since you made the decision that's changed your mind. And that's really, um, you must have voted on whatever way it was prevailing. Um, and now I've changed my mind and I'd like to reconsider the vote. Again, this is an um, this is an American motion. Uh, the British want nothing to do with reconsideration. So, this is all ours. Next slide, please. Prior to that next slide, we have a question from Regent Del Carlo. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay, we've we've done this one wrong too. I remember a, a December board meeting where um, we voted against something and we got all kinds of uh, heartache from students and faculty. They had wanted a, uh, something, a fee raise to give money to one of the colleges. At, this was up at UNR. So there was so much okay. grief. At the next meeting, we, 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 they called it a reconsider, but it, you're saying it has to be at the same meeting. So the same item went back on the agenda so I guess you can, you, that's the way to do it because we, we voted for yeah, it and, and it, voted it and in. It, yeah, and actually here's the slide that pertains to just that. Okay. It wasn't a reconsideration, it was a renewal. Oh, just, okay, a renewal. Okay, thank you. So a motion that was made and disposed of without being adopted and you did not adopt it, right? No, we didn't. It went Maybe down. Re right may be renewed by any member as it becomes substantially a different question by a change in the wording 
a change in the time or a change in the circumstances. So if the same motion was made and now at one meeting it failed, but at the next meeting, the same motion was put up and it, it was adopted, it was renewed and you were perfectly within your rights to do that. Okay, because I know we we don't, I believe we don't have a parliamentarian per se, or we've had a special counsel to the board, but they're not a registered parliamentarian. So correct. Yeah. there's been, you there, know, there lots are some, of questions. There are attorneys who are parliamentarians, but not a lot. But ours yeah. hasn't been, so thank you. Uh, yeah, but uh, you, your action was correct. It was not a reconsideration, but it was a renewal, and that action would have been legitimate. No problem. Um, and then I think one more slide. So um, this is a quote from the original author, Henry Robert. He said, it is usually a mistake to insist upon technical points as long as no one is being defrauded of their rights and the will of the majority is being carried out. The rules and customs are designed to help, not to hinder business. And, and I think parliamentary procedure scares people that they're going to use this wrong word or the wrong phrase or somehow they're, they've messed it up. But this is the caveat that I use. Is anyone being defrauded of their rights? And is the will of the majority being carried out? That Those are the important things. And if you become aware of circumstances where you're doing things um, that you could have done differently, uh, or in accordance with your parliamentary authority, all the better. Um, but make sure, again, um, no one's being defrauded of their rights, will of the majority being carried out. Uh, and then I think that's, that's a good situation. And I do applaud you for um, providing training for your board members. And, and I also applaud anybody who's willing to listen to me three times. Amazing. Um, uh, I, I do this uh, for the ACCT. I've been their parliamentarian for over 10 years, and now I do webinars for them. It's my great pleasure to do this and to have this opportunity to speak to you today. I don't want to keep anyone longer than necessary so they can make their flights, but I do appreciate your time in listening to me and seeking to hold better meetings. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time, your guidance, and, and the slides that you provided. I have no doubt we will use as resources. Um, are there any regents that have questions or comments before? Thank you very much again for your time. We, we appreciate it. You're welcome. So it's 1138. What we'll do is take a 15-minute uh, break for lunch. This will be a working lunch. Um, we will resume uh, in 15 minutes. We'll at this time move and continue on with agenda number four, system administration areas of responsibility. Um, we'll be hearing from Renee Davis, the interim vice chancellor for academic and student affairs and community colleges. Good afternoon, Renee Davis, interim vice chancellor for academic and student affairs and community colleges. And let me just start by saying, um, as you probably know, we're all here to give a very high level presentation. So you are gonna probably have lots of questions and want some information later on. So I'm always open to speak one-on-one -on -one with regents and acquaint you with um, the Academic Student Affairs Department. So I'm happy to do that. Today, I'm going to talk about not only academic and student affairs, but also institutional research. And let me just start with a quick um, org chart. And this is not the whole org chart we have um, 24 staff currently under academic and student affairs, and eight of those positions are grant funded. And then another note is that under the Director of System Sponsored Programs and App Score, 10 of the employees um, work under that part of the unit. So the primary ASA functions, academic and student affairs, are a little difficult to summarize. These are some broad categories. And I'm not going to break them all down here because I have a slide on each one of them. One of the, I would consider this almost the backbone of the ARSA committee and the ARSA committee work plan, which is the board's policies on 
new programs and organizational units. And it all starts with the planning report um, that comes to the board every December in the even years um, and can be updated every December in the odd years. Um, from there, there are policies outlining how new programs and organizational units are brought forward for approval. Um, and then once these new programs are created, there's policy around how do we evaluate and follow them and make sure they're effective and meeting the needs of, of the workforce in the community. And then as we review programs at the campus level and those are reported to the board, then decisions are made about does this program continue? And sometimes we come forward um, with campus requests to eliminate or deactivate a program. So that's a quick overview of the, of the life cycle. And I wanted to dig a little deeper into the process for new programs specifically, because this is something that every ARSA meeting, um, there's at least one new degree program um, that comes forward. And I wanted to make sure there was a little bit of an understanding of how, you know, the work that happens before it comes to the board, because a lot happens before that. So it starts out with um, usually the faculty Go, working with the provost or the vice president of academic affairs office to add a new um, suggested program to the planning report. And so that will show up in an update that the board approves. And then after that, the faculty work on building the program. Sometimes it takes some, some time to do that. Sometimes there are new courses that are needed. If that happens, then they have to approve new courses through the common course numbering process, which is something that we oversee in academic and student affairs. And then the program is submitted through the institutional approval process. Once that happens, then it would come to Academic Affairs Council. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that council in a bit. And then once it's approved by Academic Affairs, that's when it comes to the Board of Regents for approval through the ARSA committee. And then there's one more step that has to happen after that is that the program is submitted to the institutional creditor before it can be offered. So, that's in a nutshell what the process looks like. And I put as a comparison um, what a new certificate program looks like. That process is somewhat abbreviated. And that's because with certificates, we need to be allow our campuses to be more nimble so they can get those out and be responsive to the workforce needs. Now, this is one of the things I think is probably the most important point I would like to convey to especially the new regions. Um, you've already heard in some public comment and some other mentions of, of shared governance. And this is a really good example of some of the elements of shared governance within the uh, domain of academic and student affairs. So we have three councils, academic affairs, research affairs, and student affairs. And those councils meet just usually the day before the Board of Regents meeting, um, quarter, the quarterly meetings. And that helps keep some of the processes going, um, such as the program approval process, and it's a predictable timeline. Um, we have many other groups that kind of feed in through academic and student affairs. So when we bring forward, for example, a policy revision, we have had the appropriate groups that help vet to that before it gets to the board. So it comes to you in a good and, and already considered format and content. It doesn't come to you with just, you know, some one person suggested it and we bring it to you right away. So there's a process that happens before we bring it to you. And I kind of talked about that, so I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Another thing that our office does is administers the state financial aid programs. In particular, the three programs you see in bold are there, the Millennium, the Nevada Promise, and the Silver State Opportunity Grant. Um, and then the other programs, um, I also left on the slide because those are administered more by the campuses rather than a partnership with the campuses. And those, um, though, are governed by board policy. So um, there's lots of financial aid information. In, in ARSA, you get a once a year annual financial aid report. So you'll learn more within the next year. These are just some periodic reporting examples. I'm not going to dwell on them. Um, so we keep the the um, timeline on under control here, but um, if you ever have questions, you will see these come across your, your committee meetings. Um, they're always posted on the 
website. So if you ever have questions, just feel free to contact me. Finally, in um, academic and student affairs, we also, as I mentioned earlier, house system-sponsored programs in EPSCOR. And that unit really supports grant activity. And so there are research administrators and positions like that um, that do work both pre and post award. We do not have grant writer um, on staff, so it's a little different um, from sometimes what people expect, but there's lots of support that goes into administering a grant when you have grant funds. On the other side of things, we also have some positions. I mentioned the eight grant funded positions and those all fit within these categories here. So some are for outreach and student success such as Gear Up and we have um, a unique to um, the system fostering success initiative to support prospective and current students who experience foster care. And we also have some substantial workforce support activities um, under the NIA grant, Project Sandy and SNAP employment and training. So with that, I'm going to shift to institutional research. So I want to just recognize um, that we have a very small IR department. It's critical to our operations and very important to the chancellor. Um, and we just, it's an IR director and a programmer analyst and they have lots to do. So in addition to doing all of the reporting that we come to you at least every quarterly meeting, if not more frequently, they also maintain regularly um, the data warehouse. Um, there's data um, collection, um, of course, standardization. Um, and, you know, they work closely with my department um, on developing reports because that's who we go to when we need data for our reports or when the board requests data. We go to the IR department. And this um, long list, I would love to, to be able to take some time to show you, which we will do in the future, the data dashboards that are available on our website. But there's a link at the bottom where it says NGIR Home. And if you click on that link, you'll see the wide range of data dashboards we have out there, which are wonderful because it really gives you a view of who our students are, um, performance metrics, and um, everything that is part of the dashboard is disaggregated or disaggregatable by race, ethnicity, gender, full-time, part-time status, age, those types of things. And that's really important because in order to get to know who our students are, um, that's a good start. And as many of you already know, our institutions, particularly in Southern Nevada, are among the most diverse in the nation. So this one, I'm gonna use up a little of my stored time on because when you look at it, it can be a little overwhelming. So let me just say, we'll start out that this is on enrollment and headcount, uh, enrollment headcount and full-time equivalent. So, or FTE for short. So if you see the dark blue columns, that's the actual headcount. So essentially how many students we have. And you can see that it peaked in fall 2010 and I can tell you that that is actual the peak, actually the peak of all time um, at 114.809. And then all the way through fall of 22. Um, and that's considered preliminary because we always um, get a second um, data pull um, at the end of the fall semester. So um, you can see that the headcount um, has changed substantially. You can see it came down um, quite a huge drop in fall 2011. Um, that's coming out of the Great Recession. Um, and then, you know, it gradually built up and then dropped again, of course, with the pandemic. Um, interestingly, though, when you look at the full-time equivalent, which essentially is, if you're looking at FTE for a semester, it's the number of credits divided by 15. So 15 credits is one FTE. Um, so what you see essentially is that at, as of the latest semester this past fall, our um, FTE numbers are about the same as they were in fall 2010, but you can see the headcount is much lower. So what that means is that students are taking more classes. 
Um, and that is something that the system, um, in particular our institutions, have worked really hard on over the last decade or so. Now I want to talk just a little bit about persistence rates. And persistence rates are typically measured the way we've got them here on the slide, which is fall to fall. So um, it's also normally limited um, to students who are first time, full time. So for example, in that first column, in fall 2016, we had a population of students who enrolled for the first time and they were in at least 12 credits. Um, and then the question is, did they persist to fall 2017? And so what you have there is the percentage of students who actually persisted. They were new in fall 16 and they persisted to the following fall. And that's something that we follow and the campuses in particular follow very closely because it, it seems um, obvious, but I'm gonna state it anyway, that you need your students to persist obviously from year to year so they make it to graduation. So it's something that is an intermediary measure that we can track. And then, of course, you know, the gold standard that we're always looking at is the graduation rates. And again, um, when we calculate graduation rates, um, you're, you start with a cohort. So you start with a cohort of new students. And in general, it is going to be the full-time, first-time students, just like we used on that last slide. Um, we do have, um, just want to mention, we do have on the website, a graduation plus transfer out rate, that is also a good measure. Um, we only have the one slide here today though, but you can click on that link that I pointed out and you can see that other measure. Um, and really the big story here is that our institutions have improved vastly in the last decade. They're, they really have been working hard at getting more students to completion with a variety of initiatives, many um, that have been um, created in the board policies, such as the advising um, policy, financial, various financial aid policies. So it's really important to see that um, progression and improvement. And so that ends my presentation. Um, I apologize for talking so quickly. I wanted to make sure there were plenty of times for questions and then also that we could move on to the other presenters. Thank you, Renee. Um, that was a fantastic presentation. Are there any regents that have any questions or comments? If there are no questions or comments, again, thank you, Renee, for your time. Um, we'll now hear from Andrew Klinger, Chief Financial Officer. All right, good afternoon. Uh, Regents, Chair, uh, Andrew Klinger, Chief Financial Officer, uh, for the record, I guess I would first say uh, congratulations and welcome to the new Regents. It's glad to have you. Um, and then to everyone, I would also say congratulations. You have survived 111 slides. And yes, I counted them. <laughs> um, so saying that, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the finance department does and what I do. Um, and it's a little more than finance, and so I have a little bit of that in here. Uh, and then where it says, where does our money come from? It's not the where does the money for finance come from, it's where does the money for uh, the system come from? Um, but I will say in advance of this presentation, this presentation is not intended to answer all your questions, because um, that would be impossible to do in 15 minutes. Um, but instead, it's intended to get you to sort of think about some of the questions that you might have um, and then come and see me and I'm happy to go through uh, in more detail, um, whether it's the funding formula, I've literally spent two hours with a regent going through the funding formula because it is complex and until you go through it, that does not look like the right slide, there we go. Uh, until you go through it multiple times, um, you really won't understand it. And probably by the time you understand this current formula, we'll probably be on to uh, a new funding formula, for example. But um, any questions that you have after you go through this, after you see this presentation and after you've been on the board a while, um, just give me a call. Happy to um, sit down with you and go through anything related to finance. And I cannot get this to advance. It's the green button, right? It's 
what I get for saying 111 slides. Now it stops working at 112. We have some assistance maybe, for the presentation. Maybe the batteries are dead. Thank you. Oh, I can do it on my computer too, actually. TikTok. <laughs> There we go. Oh, perfect. There we go. Um, okay, so today I'm just I'm going to talk about, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about the functions of what I call finance and administration. I'm often to referred to as CFO, but there are some other functions under there that are just as important as finance, and so I'll go th through those quickly. I'll talk about core responsibilities, and the core responsibilities that I'm really going to go through today are really on the finance side. So this is going to focus primarily on the finance side. And then I want to talk about a couple of the committees um, that I staff and just give you some very high level sort of what do these committees do. Uh, and again, I'm used to working very closely with, uh, with the chairs of the committees that I staff in sort of developing the, uh, the agenda and sort of where is that meeting going to go. Um, but I think it's important for you, especially those that are on these two committees, uh, investment and business finance and facilities, to have at least just a general idea uh, of what they do. They do a lot more than what I list here, but I just wanted to give you sort of a general idea. Um, and then really, this is kind of a two-part presentation, so I'm going to sort of talk about what I do, and then I'm going to get into some uh, budget conversation. I just want to give you a very high level of what is the budget structure just in general, because there are different uh, accounts and different funds, and you'll hear about that. Um, and then I'm just going to give you in two slides uh, the operating revenues and expenditures for the entire system. Um, and obviously that's very high level in two slides when you're talking about a two plus billion dollar um, budget. Two slides is, is very high level, but I want to give you a sense of where does our money come from and how do we spend it. So these are the finance and administration functions, obviously the finance department, but also uh, under my responsibility is Ann Milkovich, our, our CIO, who you will hear from uh, later today. Uh, Alejandro Rodriguez, our Director of Government Relations, which I think everybody has uh, met and interacted with. Uh, Lisa Schaller, who is our uh, Executive Director of Risk and Insurance Management. So she does risk management for uh, the entire enterprise, uh, and I have responsibility for her as well. And then Michelle Kelly, who is the director of the uh, retirement plan alternative. So some of our uh, employees are in PERS. Uh, those that are not are in the retirement plan alternative, and she uh, administers um, that plan. So on the finance department side, and again, this doesn't represent all of my employees. Uh, so my assistant, Melissa Glenn, um, she's the one who keeps me on track. Um, so if you ever need to get a hold of me and you can't get a hold of me, call Melissa and she will track me down. I kid her. I say I actually work for her, um, which is um, the way I like it, frankly. Um, also in my office, I have Chris Gaub, who is the SCS budget and contract director. So we have consolidated the budget and finance functions for SCS and system administration. Those are all within my office, and Chris Gaub runs the SCS side of sort of the budget and finance component. Uh, Rhett Vertrice, uh, my assistant CFO, um, he does the financial statements essentially for um, the, the, the system, uh, as well as managing the, the daily treasury function, cash, and investments as well. And then also we have the budget side, and that position just unfortunately. Um, became vacant. My current budget director uh, took another uh, position in Colorado. She's still on part-time helping me through the legislative session, but that position is uh, currently vacant. So core responsibilities of the, the finance department. So number one on this list, and I put that one number one for a reason, the biggest thing we do is the coordination of the biennial budget request uh, that goes to the governor's office. 
Um, obviously, as we sit here today, we are waiting for the governor's recommended budget for the 24-25 uh, uh, budget cycle coming up. But believe it or not, the process for that biennial state budget uh, request for the biennium after that will start in the fall. So we'll go through legislative session, and then literally in the fall, we will start that uh, entire process over again. So that is one of the main functions uh, of our office, which is why that vacant budget director position uh, is so critical to, uh, to fill. Uh, preparation of the annual financial statements. So we do prepare uh, an audited annual financial statement. Uh, and you will see that typically, um, at least we, we hope, it doesn't always make it there um, in December, but in December of each year on the audit committee, you will see our annual financial statements. We then send that annual financial statement to the state and they actually roll it up with what they call their CAFR, uh, which is in the entire state's uh, financial system. Um, our financial statements have been held up the last couple of years due to um, circumstances beyond our control. And so sometimes you will see those final financial statements come to you uh, in the spring. Uh, I mentioned the uh, system-wide cash management, or otherwise known as the uh, operating pool. We essentially manage the treasury function for the entire uh, system. And I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more in some future slides. Uh, mentioned the, the funding formula. So the funding formula was uh, developed through an interim study about a decade ago. Uh, and really it's the legislative funding formula. Um, and I'm not gonna go into uh, the funding formula today. I can literally spend an hour just talking about the, the funding formula. And trust me, that presentation will put you to sleep. Um, but uh, it's one of the most important things that, that we do. And this is essentially the funding formula. What it does is it distributes the state resources to the institutions. And it does that through what we call weighted student credit hours. And so without getting into a presentation on the funding formula, um, I think the takeaway from that bullet point is that is the main funding mechanism for the teaching institutions. Um, and I think that's probably given the time today, it's probably about all I can say about that. Um, preparation of the fi of financial reports to the board. Uh, this happens primarily through uh, the Business Finance and Facilities Committee, although we do bring some reports to the main board. So all of your budgets, so the board is uh, required to approve the budget. So you approve the budgets uh, based on, so the state gives us their funding and then we will bring a budget to you in the fall uh, of the state budget that you approve. You also approve what we call the self-supporting budgets, which are budgets that are uh, funded from primarily student fees, sales and services, those sorts of things. And so we will bring you a packet of budgets for that. And then we also bring budget to actual reports. And again, most of those flow through the Business Finance and Facilities Committee. Some of those reports you will see uh, on the main board. And then the last two bullets on there, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I am staff to me and my staff are staff to the investment uh, committee, as well as the Business Finance and Facilities Committee. Um, so the Investment Committee, and again, just wanted to give you a very high level. So what does the Investment Committee do? Uh, the Investment Committee formulates um, investment policies, essentially, uh, and also implements those. And then the other component of that is the Investment Committee uh, evaluates uh, the returns on our investment. So we have essentially, and I'll get into those, there's sort of two pieces to the investment committee. There's the operating pool, which I mentioned earlier, um, and I'll get into that in the next slide. And then there's the endowment and the investment committee oversees both of those. And in both cases, we have outside consultants uh, that help us uh, and make recommendations uh, for investments as well as for our policies related to, uh, to our investments. So let me go to the operating pool first. Um, and I think maybe the simplest way, and this isn't exact, exactly how it works, but I think it's uh, a way to help sort of understand, at least in my mind, um, what the operating pool is. So think about the, that all eight institutions plus system administration plus SCS, so 10 of us, we all have our own separate checking accounts where we can 
uh, go out and you know procure services and do sorts of things. At the end of the day, that all rolls up into one pool. That is the operating pool. So it is essentially the collection uh, of all of our cash assets uh, in the system. And it changes based on whether we have payroll, whether we have student fees coming in, but that pool is about $800 million. Uh, and so on any given day, we don't need all 800 million of that. So we don't leave it in cash. We divide it into uh, three different investment pools, a long-term investment pool, a medium term and a short term. And part of what the investment committee does is it oversees those investments and makes make sure that we're within our investment policies, make sure that uh, we're achieving the results that we expected. Uh, and so that's part of what the uh, investment committee does. Um, what we do with the proceeds or, or the return on investment, I should say not the proceeds, the return on investment in the operating pool is we essentially distribute those out to the campuses. Um, and I, I think a key piece of this that you should take away is it's not cash because we also distribute unrealized gains. So if we have appreciation in our equities, we actually distribute that out um, to the campus on a monthly basis. So it's not just like we're sending them cash, we're actually sending them, here's your share of the appreciation in our portfolio. Uh, and that is done based on each institution's sort of essentially cash balance in this pool. So UNLV a lot of times is right around 50%. So 50% of those uh, unrealized and realized gains go to UNLV. Um, changes every month depending on their share, but generally it's right around uh, 49%. So next is the uh, ENCHI endowment fund. So we do have an endowment fund at the system level and it's approximately $300 million. Again, that changes with markets uh, and market conditions, but it's right around uh, $300 million. That endowment is in addition to the foundation. So each institution also has their own foundation. So the ENCHI endowment is really a legacy of the, uh, the system when it was sort of first established. This, is, this was the first endowment fund and it still exists. And so that endowment fund contains monies that belong to the institutions. Uh, it belongs to the universities, the community colleges. Uh, and so we manage that endowment essentially on their uh, behalf. Now the endowment, we do outsource that. So we essentially, uh, what it's called outsource chief investment officer. So we have a firm uh, that we have essentially delegated the authority to manage those funds um, to them, uh, and they do that on our behalf. We recently, in the last two years, we've changed the uh, membership on the investment committee, and we have added members from the two university uh, foundations from their investment committees. Uh, and I have to say, I think our last investment committee was one of the best because of their presence, because they are experts uh, in the field of investing. And so to bring them into that um, committee has really changed that dynamic. And they ask questions that, um, frankly, I wouldn't know to ask and that uh, you as regents wouldn't know to ask. So I think uh, we've made some significant improvements with that. So uh, investment committee essentially manages the operating pool as well as the ENCHI endowment fund. Um, business finance and facilities. So this is the other uh, committee uh, that I staff. Uh, and so really it comes down to primarily what business finance and facilities does is anytime there's a real estate transaction, whether it's a purchase or a sale, that has to go through uh, what we call BFF. Um, anytime there's a lease, that also has to go through uh, BFF. Now I mentioned the, the state and self-supporting budget reports. Um, so there's a lot of those budget reports, those come through uh, BFF. Now, one of the things um, that we've done recently uh, with Chair Carvalho, who was previously Chair of BFF and is again gonna be a Chair of BFF, is we have began to review the charge uh, or the responsibilities, if you will, of what the BFF does because that has not been looked at in some time, because as we went through it and looked at it, there are things in there that are just 
kind of out of date and need to be updated. So we are in the process. So for those of you that are on VFF, you're gonna see that come back to the committee with some recommendations on, here's maybe some things that we need to add, here's some things that we need to take away, here's some things that we need to make adjustments. There are a lot of other things that are required under the code uh, that BFF does, but these are sort of the primary things uh, that BFF does that I wanted to at least um, give you um, today. So switching gears, and I got four minutes and 30 seconds left, um, overview of our budget structure. So essentially the budgets that you see are, there are state supported budgets, and I think that's kind of obvious. Um, that's where the state funding goes, and that's done primarily through the instructional institutions. That's the formula funding. Professional schools are the medical schools, the dental school, the law school, and D then DRI. We also have non-formula budgets. System administration is a non-formula budget. SCS is a non-formula budget. There are also statewide programs at both universities that are considered non-formula budgets. So these are sort of the different types of budgets under the state operating uh, budgets. We then have non-state budgets, and I talked about this before, so self-supporting. And self-supporting would be things like parking. Parking is a self-supporting activity. You collect a fee from a student for parking, and so it has its own budget, and that parking fee supports everything related to parking. That's what self-supporting uh, budgets are. Another example would be residence life. So the dorm fees that you pay is another self-supporting budget. You pay a fee, all of that funding supports the operation and maintenance uh, of the dorms. In addition to self-supporting, we also have uh, grants, contracts, loans, and endowments. Um, and really all of those under non-state are, are usually pretty restricted, right? If you collect a fee for parking, you're not gonna then divert that funding for um, scholarships. That money is for parking. Grants and contracts are the same way. If you enter into a grant or a contract, those funds are usually restricted for a, a very specific purpose. Um, there's a little more detail on uh, state versus non-state. Given the time, I am going to sort of go right past the slide and go into the total revenue and operating uh, expenditures. And again, this is a $2 billion budget summarized in two slides. Uh, we budget uh, really everything down to what we call a program level, if you will. Uh, and again, just to sort of highlight the complexity of how big a $2 billion budget is, we have over 30,000 programs. So we essentially have over 30,000 mini little budgets spread across all of the institutions. So this is everything rolled up from your financial statements for fiscal year 22. And so you can see at the very top, grants and contracts uh, makes up 33%, roughly 717 uh, million there. Next is state appropriations. And I will say that grants and contracts number is higher in fiscal 22 than it normally is, and that is because of ARP funding. Um, so we're obviously in the middle of collecting ARP funding still, and so that number is usually not uh, as high as it is in fiscal 22. State appropriations, again, that is the money uh, that comes from the state, and that's what we're about ready to go ask uh, the next legislative session for is uh, to continue that funding and hopefully increase it in some cases. Uh, and then tuition and fees. So you see the $477 million uh, a year that we collect in tuition and fees. Now, when you talk about the state operating budget versus the non-state operating budget, some of those tuition and fees actually go into the state budget and some of them go into non-state. And again, in a short presentation like this, I'm not going to be able to get sort of into the details of that, but those tuition and fees do split between state uh, and non-state, and it's actually in our procedures and guidelines manual exactly what those splits are. Uh, and then sales and services, and you see the rest, and again, a $2.1 billion budget um, that you all are uh, responsible for at the end of the day. And then final slide is just where does that money go? Um, because we are essentially a service organization in general, 61% um, of it goes to employee compensation uh, and benefits, um, and then supplies and services, and supplies and services is uh, anything from vendor contracts or um, anything else that we, we buy essentially related to operating, and then you can see scholarships, fellowships, um, and the rest on there, and look at that, I got 10 seconds left, perfect. <laughs> that was fantastic, great, great timing. 
Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments? Regent Brown? Um, I know we don't have time to go over this, uh, but with the legislative session coming, um, can we, and I know we'll talk about it on, on the third, I believe, uh, but can you just give a, a quick, you know, how does that budget get to the legislature when it started with our presidents came to us and now eight months later, it's, or six months later, it's, it's starting at the legislature. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. that's an excellent um, question for the record, Chief Financial Officer uh, Andrew Klinger. So, like I said, it'll start. It starts in the fall of the, you know this year for um, next year. So, sort of going through the entire cycle, we do campus visits to each campus to get their priorities. Uh, we then bring those, and we have a series of meetings with the board, and we go through that process. And the board ultimately, last August, voted to approve a budget. Now, what we do is we essentially transmit that budget to the governor's finance office, which we did. It's due September 1st, so we did that last September 1st. That budget was transmitted to the governor's finance office. From there, it really becomes their budget. It becomes the governor's budget. It first started uh, under former Governor Sisolak uh, up until January 2nd. So up until January 2nd, it was Governor Sisolak's budget. He made recommendations or, uh, yeah, I guess recommendations in that budget. And then once Governor Lombardo took over on January 2nd, it became his. And so we're in that process right now where it is Governor Lombardo's budget. Under NRS, that budget has to be transmitted to the legislature on January 23rd. Um, so 14 days before the start of the legislative session. So the governor will then transmit that budget on January 23rd. And I'm hoping that we will find out at least confidentially what that budget looks like for us. Um, because technically the governor doesn't have to tell us until he makes it public uh, on the 23rd. But generally the governor's finance office will give us um, an idea of what's included in there so we can start preparing for um, the legislative session. From there, um, uh, the first look at it by the legislature is what they call the uh, Legislative Commission's Budget Subcommittee meeting. We have a meeting scheduled for January 27th. Uh, it's an hour-long uh, presentation that starts at 11.15 on the, the 27th. I've had some regents ask me about that. That is a public meeting. Anybody can go to that. You can watch it online. Um, so we will have uh, an hour, essentially, to present the highlights of our budget. But it's the highlights of our budget as recommended by the governor. So there may be things that the regents recommended that are not in there that we will not present because that time is really focused for legislators on what's in the governor's budget as it relates to, uh, to the Nevada system of higher education. Um, once legislative session starts, we'll, we will be assigned to uh, a joint subcommittee. So it's a joint subcommittee of both the assembly and the Senate. They have an education joint subcommittee um, and I'm assuming we'll do that again. And right around the end of February and the middle of March, so end of February, we'll have our first joint subcommittee meeting uh, with those folks where we'll get to go into more detail on what's included in our budget. And then we'll do that again uh, sometime in March. And there have been years during session where we've actually had a third joint subcommittee meeting. Two years ago, we only had two, so it just depends. Um, and then they'll also do separate joint subcommittees for the capital improvements, uh, which hopefully we have some of those on the list. So I know it's a very long answer to your question, but uh, hopefully that helps. I do appreciate, do you mind a quick, um, I do appreciate that. And, and maybe this can be um, for, for a later meeting, uh, but in preparation for holding this position, I've looked at 10 years worth of budgets and I do have questions from this process that you just explained. Um, and then the budget's looking differently when they come back into the ENCHI hands. Is there a process for this board to manipulate, and maybe that's the wrong word, but to change numbers slightly um, on the back end after the legislative session? Yeah, no, and another. Did, and what does that look like for us? No, absolutely. Um, another great um, question. So, at the, uh, you know, the board actually has ultimate authority for the um, operating expenses, if you will, or the budgets of the system. So you as a board get to sort of approve the final budget. Um, what 
what we don't do is we don't change the allocation of state resources, right? Okay. So, the, okay. the, so the state allocates out the state resources to the institutions based on the funding formula. The board doesn't touch that allocation, but within each institution's budget, where they, where an institution may have said, I'm going to spend this much on instruction and this much on student services, we can move that around within okay. those, but we don't move appropriations. If we want to move appropriations, we actually have to go back and get interim finance approval to do that. Okay, that is super helpful clarification. Yeah. Um, can I ask? Oh, I'll, I'll wait. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I have another different topic. Okay, I apologize. Go ahead, Regina. Um, when you mentioned endowment, um, can you give an example, um, recent if there is one, when that money in the endowment might have been spent and what it was accessed for? Um, so we do a regular distribution to the campuses on that. Um, and again, it's the campuses' money. They, you know, each, each institution has a share of that overall um, pool. Basically, what we're responsible for is just investing it. So we do distributions to them. Uh, from that pool, and it's mostly for scholarships. is is primarily what those what those dollars are for. And but like, and she as the institution doesn't access that money no. for any. Okay, no. that's what I want. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. We do. We do. However, just to clarify, we do have uh, an administrative fee that we we charge on those. Regent Boylan, you have a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, just because I'm on this board, I'm. A wee bit curious. Who sets the budget for this board, and how much is the budget? I just, I mean, you're a wee bit, and I'm like, where, where is this money coming from? How are we spending it? Uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, this board sets this the 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 budget for for the board. So within the system administration office, uh, we establish budgets for each area. So there's a budget for finance. There's a budget for academic affairs. There's a budget for the board and the board office. And essentially, at the end of the day, this board uh, establishes what that looks like. Okay, I see. I've been here two years, and I haven't seen or heard of that. So when you say this board, do we vote on it? Or does the chair just do that? Or, I've, you know, I haven't seen or heard of it. Well, the budget, uh, so the, the, the system administration budget that is approved by the board, it comes with all the other budgets. So it's approved as part of that. So when we bring uh, the budgets to the Business Finance and Facilities Committee in December, it's part of that um, package. Um, and what we do typically on the budgets is we look at, okay, what did we spend in the prior year? And it's generally based on that. Um, now we work with, obviously, your uh, chief of staff as well as the chair if there are changes needed to that budget. Um, because no budget is perfect, and you always have to make changes to that budget throughout the year. So as we make changes, we work with your staff and with the chair to, to make those changes. So there's no fixed amount is what I'm, I'm asking. No. The, well, the fixed amount is, is how much do you have in reserves and how much do you anticipate coming in in revenue. That's really the limitation. And we have some flexibility because we do have about four months worth of reserve. So if we have to dip down a little bit to to fund you know, something extraordinary, we can do that. Um, so there's a fixed amount based on how much money we have, essentially. Thank you so much, and that helps. Thank you. Are, are there any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. We appreciate your time in the presentation. Um, next, we will hear from James Martinez, the Vice Chancellor for Legal Affairs and, and our Chief General Counsel. Good afternoon. After this presentation, everybody will be experts in my field, so I won't be needed. So as, as a lot of, for the record, Jim Martinez, Chief General Counsel, as we've seen in the last couple of yesterday and earlier today, the, my area crosses over into a lot of other areas. So by no means is this presentation intended to give everybody answers, but more than that, raise the questions and make everybody aware of where questions need to be asked. So that brings me to my first slide. Um, even, even the title of the presentation, uh, you as our client, I, I capitalized you because even that needs to be unpacked. And it has a lot to do with 
not just you, but you in your capacity as a regent and what that entails. So when I was when I was going through this and I was trying to figure out how to have that conversation and, and how the organization is our client, I realized the first thing I really need to do is make sure that we're all clear on what the organization is. So that brings us to a, a brief history about the origin of the system. In 1864, Article 11, Section 4 of the Constitution mandated the establishment of a state university that is to be controlled by a board of regents. In 1907, the legislature, following the mandate in the, in the Constitution, enacts NRS 396, and that's where it states that the, the legal and corporate name of the constitutional university will be the University of Nevada and that it shall be governed by the Board of Regents. In 1969, the legislature amends th NRS 396 and creates the, the University of Nevada system. So that's the first time they really acknowledge that this is beyond a university. Now we're talking about the organization becomes a system. Then in 1993, the legislature amends NRS 396 again. And at this time, it acknowledges the community, college, community colleges and administrative units that are part of the system and changes the name to the University and Community College System of Nevada. Then in 2005, the legislature again amends NRS 396. We, they recognize that we have grown beyond just university and community colleges. We have research institutions, administrative units. So they just simplify the, the definition to the Nevada system of higher education that we are called today. So what are the important takeaways from this history? In my view, the most important two things to take away from this is that NSHE is one organization. And this one organization includes the constitutionally created university. In the past, there's been a lot of confusion as to whether or not the university is separate. If the board is a separate entity from the system, we are one entity. And the second takeaway is that the Board of Regents is the elected body charged with governing this organization. So it is not, again, it is not separate. It is just like any other governing body over a private corporation or a city council. This is the governing body that is part of this organization. So that brings us to who is our client? Uh, Nevada, Rural Civil, Nevada Rules of Civil Procedure, or of Professional Conduct, I'm sorry. Um, they state that a lawyer employed to retain or retained by an organization represents the organization acting through its duly authorized constituents. Uh, that's because really the organization itself is kind of a legal fiction. I never get to deal directly with my overall client, the organization. I deal with my client only through its authorized constituents. In dealing with an organization's directors, officers, employees, members, shareholders, or other constituents, a lawyer shall explain to the identity shall explain the identity of the client to the constituent and reasonably attempt to ensure that the constituent realizes that the lawyer's client is the organization rather than the constituent. This is where it gets, it gets a little dicey and there's a lot of questions around this. And again, I'm not gonna be able to answer all questions in, in my remaining 15 minutes, but what I would like to point out is that while the organization is the overall client and the board is the governing body for that organization, you are the client in your role as a fiduciary of that organization. So it's not that you are not a client as we would normally think about it in everyday use. It's just that it is a more complex structure of the attorney-client relationship. So we've explained the organization. The organization is the Nevada System of Higher Education as defined in Nevada Revised Statutes 396.020. And as I just, I got a little ahead of myself. So the organization is a legal, legal fiction and it can't speak for itself. It speaks through the board. So who are the duly authorized constituents that, that we're talking about? The Board of Regents who are responsible for governing the system. 
Um, also, the officers of the university, which in the bylaws define as the chancellor and the presidents. Um, and, and also, it can be agency. There can be employees who, ha who are charged. The board can vote to give somebody agency to do certain things. In all of these situations, somebody could be our client acting in there in a, a role where they can bind the organization. I'm not going to go over this slide. This slide is just meant to kind of show you the overall structure and assign some, some terms for your, for your use. So NC Legal Affairs, who are we? This is, you know, for your references, this is a, an, a brief org chart. Um, it, it will be changed a little bit as, as many of you got the email this morning. Tina Rossum just took a, an associate general counsel position at CSN. And so we'll, we will be looking to fill that position fairly soon. Uh, we, Mike Wixom did touch on this yesterday, the reporting structure of the general counsel. Uh, because of the, the unique situation of an attorney representing an organization, when there's a reporting structure, where we report to a CEO or in this case, the chancellor, it's important to have a, an org structure that, and policy that allows for conflicts to arise. In our case, we already have policy in Title IV that states that when a conflict arises between the chancellor and the board, the client, then it is my duty to change my reporting line, and I no longer, for that specific purpose, report to the chancellor, I report to the board chair. That's very important because it, it gives this board security in knowing that my office cannot represent any individual employee. It, it represents the organization, and if there's ever that conflict, we have a solution. This slide just tells you a little bit about institution general counsel reporting. Now, at one time, our office housed all of the attorneys throughout the entire system. Years ago, a change was made, and I think it was a good change, where we took the, the general counsels who were assigned to institutions and put them directly on campus. So they would have direct access to the presidents and the administration for that institution. So today, for our institution general counsels, their direct daily reporting is to the president of the institution. He approves their leave. He does their annual evaluations. Um, it's just a day-to-day -day evaluation. There is still a dotted line up to my position for the legal supervision. So we meet uh, at least monthly with all of the general counsels and make sure that we're all on the same page, maintain consistency throughout the system. So what does legal do? We are, by definition, general counsel. We are not intended to be certified experts in any of these areas. When for immigration, for example, if we do need expertise in that area, we do seek outside counsel who are experts in that area. Um, but as you can see, we are, a, a, we are a lean office, system administration. There is currently three of us. And these are just some of the things that we do on a daily basis. And so what I want to do is this is one of the things that, that we touched on yesterday also. Um, a final word on privilege, because I think attorney-client privilege in this structure when we represent an organization is, is worth talking about because it can be confusing. When, when an attorney represents an organization, the attorney-client privilege is held by the organization. And what we have to remember with that is, if it's held by the organization, how does the organization act to waive attorney-client privilege? It, the bylaws are clear that this board must act through a, a vote of the board, and that no individual region outside of that can bind the board. So what that means is if there is a waiver of attorney-client privilege that 
the board would like to make, the board has to consider that and vote on it in order to waive that privilege. Um, this goes right along with what Mr. Wixom was talking about yesterday with the board's fiduciary duties. If, if, for example, if we send out a privileged memo to the full board and it's got the attorney-client privileged notice on there, each individual regent has that fiduciary duty to the organization. No individual regent on their own has the authority to waive that because what's important to remember is once one regent waives that privilege, it's waived. There's no taking it back. So if we go to a court, the court can't go back in time and suddenly take that back and erase it from memory. It's done. So, but if that causes liability to the organization, then under NRS, I think it's 162, that's the chapter that, that talks about your fiduciary duties. There could be liability to the organization for, for the breach. So once there's a breach, there's not a lot we can do to go back in time and repair it. It's out there and, and we just have to deal with it. So it's, so it's very important that if those types of questions come up, just give us a call, just talk to us about it. If you feel like there's a situation where there could need to be a waiver, that's the point where our office can get involved. We can put an agenda item together. We can, if it's related to litigation, we can, we can have a, a attorney client session. There's a lot of things that we can do, but it's important to not waive it without going through that process. And that was the, the last of my slides. And I know I went through that very quickly and I wanted to do so intentionally so that we had some time for questions because I, I know this, these can be complex items. Thank you, we, we appreciate the presentation. Uh, Regent Boylan does have a question. Thanks, uh, Chair. Appreciate it. I'm, you know, still confused, <laughs> as always. The more you tell me, the more I get confused. So when you say when someone on the board waves it, what, what exactly do you mean by that? You send us a letter saying, I don't know, so-and-so is going to, you know, sue us. Mm -hmm. And this is client uh, attorney privileged. And let's say I go out and I go and tell my best friend, you know what they're going to be doing. I don't have a best friend. Well, anyway, uh, and I say, okay, they're going to do this. That means I've waived the privilege for the whole board. And what does that mean? Waiving it. Yes. So is so that it? I mean, really, is that the way? That, that could be one situation. So it could be um, that we send out a, a privileged attorney-client memorandum with, with confidential information in it that, that we intend to use to help protect the organization. As we do that, once that is sent out to the public, we no longer have control of this information. You might send it to one person. They could then send it to the entire city. It's out there. And at that point, it's, it's considered waived. So if I may, just one more. So it's not like, uh, you know, my Irish Catholic heritage, I go to confession. And you have to keep the secret. You're the priest, you're the client. Uh, I'm the client. So it's not like that, that it's, you can't tell anybody and we can't tell anybody either. Correct. So we're both bound by it. Yes. Uh, I see. I'm not going to confession, but thank you so much. That helps. Are there any other questions or comments? Again, thank you very much for the presentation. We appreciate it, and we appreciate your, your willingness to field questions uh, at another date. Thank you. Right, um, we'll now hear from Joe Sunbury, who's a chief internal auditor. Oh, I get 15? <laughs> All right, let's do it. Thank you, Chair Brooks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. For the record, my name is Joe Sumner. I'm currently the Chief Internal Auditor here at NSHE. I have the very difficult task today of attempting to make internal audit appear interesting. Um, I smile as I say that, realizing that learning about internal audit and perhaps even serving on the audit committee is probably not the reason you ran for office. But for those of you who have served on the Audit Compliance and Title IX Committee previously, 
Uh, hopefully you've seen firsthand some of the value we can add within the organization. I was doing a presentation uh, for the system office last month, and I had a, what I thought was a pretty good analogy. Um, so I'll share that again briefly, and I apologize to those that heard this before. Um, those of you of a certain vintage may recall a show in the 70s and 80s called ABC's Wide World of Sports. It aired on Saturday mornings, and at the beginning, there's this great montage of various, various sports and this perfect voiceover, and I can't do it justice, but we're spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sport, the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat, the human drama of athletic competition. And I decided that's actually a very good analogy describing who we are in internal audit, what we do, and why we do it. We're spanning the organization, shining a light on a variety of institutions, programs, departments, processes, procedures, controls, some that absolutely highlight the thrill of getting it right, doing the right thing, doing it the right way. And unfortunately, identifying some defeats, some deficiencies. I love the last phrase too, human drama. I think it's important because this organization has a lot of great tools, a lot of great technology, great systems set up, but there's absolutely that human element. We need auditors to help us monitor that. So very quickly, for the next three or four hours, I'd like, no, I'm just joking. So the next, next few minutes, this is what I want to accomplish, right? I, I just want to let you know who we are, uh, if you don't know already, and I'll, I'll show you that obligatory org chart. But beyond that, talk a little bit about our unique reporting structure. Uh, next, what are we? What does an internal auditor actually do? Uh, how and where it's defined in your handbook? And finally, just why? Why do we do this? Why, why is it important? So starting with that obligatory org chart. I tallied this up fairly recently. The seven people on this slide have a combined NSHE internal audit experience of 90 years in addition to some of the professional experience they brought with them to ENSHI. So we've got some internal knowledge here. Our disbursement is geographical. Uh, we've got a presence in Reno. Our three dedicated in Reno are on the right side of your screen there, uh, Scott, Debbie, and Eric. Our two dedicated in Las Vegas, Lauren and Daisy, and then Alex, who represents our entire IT audit department, as well as my role, are statewide in nature, and we're both based here in Las Vegas. So it's my role plus six others at the moment. Uh, when I first started seven and a half years ago, it was my role plus 10 others. Uh, but we pride ourselves on doing more with less, right? We, we leverage a lot of expertise around our institutions so that we can run pretty lean. Uh, there's more collaboration than ever before. Uh, we continue to leverage technology and uh, try to find those efficiencies in getting our work done. So... I want to talk very quickly about our unique reporting structure. I've joked with the chancellor before about being on Audit Island, which sounds like the world's worst uh, reality TV show. Uh, but, but internal audit best practice is, is to have what's known as a dual reporting relationship. And that's important because that's what allows our department to maintain independence, maximize public accountability. It allows us to truly perform independent assessments. So functionally, our team reports to the chair of the Audit Compliance and Title IX Committee as of a few days ago, that is Regent Perkins. Uh, administratively, that's where things get a little interesting. I'll share some history. So uh, for decades, this department rolled up into NSHE's finance group and we reported administratively to the CFO, which kind of made sense because so much of what we did back then had a financial twinge to it. But as we revamped our risk assessment process and branched into other types of projects, we expanded on that audit universe. That, that's my first callback to that wide world of internal audit, right? Um, we truly do span the organization and not just focus on financial statement risks. So late in 2018, uh, the board changed the handbook uh, to where our department and specifically my role reports administratively to the chair of the board. So the dual reporting I spoke of earlier still remains, but now both reporting avenues are to individual board members. So that's a little bit about who we are. But what are we? What do we do? And I'm not going to stand here and regurgitate your, your handbook verbatim, um, but I do think it's worth sharing with you, you know, that, that first reference section, Title I, Article VI, Section 3. You know, we're ultimately here to help carry out the duties of the Audit Compliance and Title IX Committee. That committee, and I highly recommend tuning in in March, even if you're not on that committee, it reviews and evaluates our internal audit reports, which includes you know, recommendation for policy change, um, you know, follow-ups to correct deficiencies we may have noted, um, you know, ensuring we're, we're, we're following established, you know, policies and procedures, established guidelines. So those reports, as, as you'll see in March, they're presented in that public setting, and the recommendations 
uh, that we have, as well as the institution's action plans, are already embedded into the report. And that does a couple things, right? It helps expedite discussion, but it also shows that that partnership we have with management in, in getting their buy-in, that collaborative approach. We want to work and help find solutions, not just identify the problems, right? So the other duty I quickly wanted to mention from that particular section, Title I, Article VI, Section 3, uh, relates to the committee's duty to recommend a CPA firm to audit the financial statements of ENCHI. And you heard CFO Klinger reference the financial statements. So we have an independent CPA firm, Grant Thornton is their name, and you'll see them come back uh, hopefully in March with a final report. Um, you know, the, they'll present the final results of their financial statement audit as well as the audit of uh, federal student aid and other major programs. So the financial statements, as CFO Klinger mentioned, those are the responsibility of management, uh, but the external auditors will present uh, their audit opinion as well as other required communications, and that'll include a report on any deficiencies noted. Um, there'll be an opportunity to discuss it with all the parties involved. And I bring that up too, because for what it's worth, my team, we do help coordinate in some of those efforts. And because of our independent nature, we get involved with some of the testing and help save on overall audit fees. So there's another reference uh, near the bottom of the slide there, uh, and that's where you can find our internal audit charter. And again, I'm not gonna read that verbatim, but want to touch on a couple points within it, right? It states, we're here to enhance and protect organizational value by providing risk-based objective assurance, advice, and insight. And then it goes on and lists about a dozen examples of how we strive to attain this. Things you'd expect to see, you know, reviewing accounting and operational controls, ascertaining the extent of compliance with established policy. But one of the ones I like the most is, is number 10 on the list, which involves sharing information and coordinating activities with other internal and external assurance and consulting service providers. And you'll hear me talk at literally every audit committee meeting about collaboration, utilizing expertise around the system. We run lean, but this helps maximize our coverage. So I'll, I'll, I've got seven minutes left and I'll go into our audit plan creation here in a minute. But a question that I get fairly frequently from, from regents and others is, okay, so you have the authority from the board, the internal audit activity is established by the board of regents but who the heck audits the auditors? So I'll conveniently, conveniently point out that in our audit charter, specifically section eight, uh, I'm required to share at least once every five years the results of our external assessments. So in our world, this is known as a quality assurance review. Uh, we just did one uh, that finished up, I think last year. I'm happy to report we generally conformed in, in all matters, had a couple of minor recommendations from our independent validator but this helps us ensure that we're keeping up to speed with our ever-changing industry standards. Uh, I bring that up because when I first started in this role over seven years ago, I benefited from that. Literally in my first audit committee meeting, September 2015, we presented the results of our QAR, which gave me a roadmap that'll kind of drive how we roll today. So that QAR seven years ago pointed out what we, that it really said we needed to revamp two things. One was, our audit universe, again, that, that wide world, right? So historically, what we'd do is we'd keep this running log of everything that we audited. Uh, but if the problem is, if we had never audited that area before, it really wasn't on our radar. So we spent a lot of time creating a much more robust universe, giving us a better snapshot of what's going on around the system. The other item requiring a revamp was our risk factors. As I mentioned before, historically, we leaned heavily, almost entirely, on financial risk. And while that's still an important factor today, we have to think about things like operational risk, regulatory risk, health and safety risk, IT exposure, strategic risk, all those types of things. So I won't get into the weeds, but we assign weights to those. We bump those up against our audit universe, and that sort of naturally some things rise to the top. And that's really the major factor of that first bullet point there, our, our audit plan. Uh, we, we, that's that risk-based approach that we attempt to use to align our plan with, with things that matter and are relevant to the system and our stakeholders. Uh, to the second bullet point, we realize risks often don't wait to show up until the next fiscal year. So we have to build in uh, into the plan some agility, some flexibility uh, to address any emerging issues in real time. Uh, historically, we had this year long static plan, uh, but now we've, we've increased the frequency in which this plan is, is uh, presented for approval, and we also have buckets of time for important but perhaps unforeseen uh, projects and requests. So the other thing that I'll mention is, you know, we want to ensure we're we're maximizing our coverage, right? 
So we, in our audit plan, include and emphasize training, professional development, um, to make sure we're keeping our competencies current. You know, my team consists of CPAs, CIAs, CISAs, CFEs. Uh, you know, we, we've got to stay current on those, uh, on those certifications. So um, in the rest of the bullet points, just in the spirit of time, I'll sum it up this way. We tell you what we're going to do, and we do it. Then, you then we tell you what we did. And then we, in we include management action plans, and then we follow up to make sure they did what they said they were going to do. And that's the rest of that. And I'm finally at my last slide here. So in conclusion here, I, it, uh, this is really where I get into the why. You know, why audit and, and compliance? Um, you know, data typically shows that stronger organizations tend to embrace a compliance culture. They have strong monitoring functions. It's a fundamental part of any solid internal control framework, enterprise risk management framework, all of those things. Um, the other thing is, is you know, risk is, is truly infinite. Um, resources are finite. So my team can help balance that by bringing another set of eyes in a particularly risky area, right? We can step in and even play an advisory or consulting role where we need to. We've done that several times in the last few years with, with a lot of success. Um, as part of this, I asked my team why they like being an energy internal audit, and I listed some of their some of the themes in their re responses. You know, they talked about this being rewarding. They talked about the people here, the relationships they developed, but most importantly, driving positive change. And I think that's that's huge because, and I don't have this on the slide, but I'll conclude with this. You know, originally this profession it was invented to provide hindsight. Right? Let's look at historical transactions. Make sure you did what you're supposed to do. And as I noted, we still do that. But modern auditors and compliance professionals attempt to take that another step and provide as much real-time insight. So as we cultivate our knowledge of the organization, as we identify those lessons from our hindsight and our insight, and we better understand the organizational strategies and risk, we kind of help figure out what, what could the future look like. I think that's the next iteration of where this profession is going and hopefully where my team is headed. It's one that keeps its eye on the horizon uh, and hopefully can provide foresight. So I thank you very much. My last slide just has my contact info. Uh, any of the uh, regions that have been around a bit know I love to talk internal audit. So come talk anytime. Thanks. Thank you. We greatly appreciate that, uh, Joe. We do have a question from Regent Perkins. Um, yes, thank you for the presentation. Very informative. Um, the Reporting lines. Why exactly did they change, and is that, was it just why did why did they change the reporting lines? Uh, that's a that's a wonderful question. I don't know that I can answer that in the next minute and thirty five seconds, but uh, I I think it was to leave no doubt about internal audit's independence. Right. So, for instance, if uh, if there was something that I needed to audit in the CFO's office or in the chancellor's office, I can do so independently because I report both administratively and functionally to, to the board. And I, I think that was the crux of it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any other questions or comments? Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it again. Um, and now we'll hear from uh, Dr. Adam Milkovich, who is the Chief Information Officer. Hi, Ann Milkovich for the record, and thank you Chair Brooks and Vice Chair Ariscata and Regents um, for this opportunity to show you the value that System Computing Services, or SCS, brings to ENSHI and Nevada. SCS serves both the, the ENSHI institutions and the state of Nevada. We have a dual mission that way, and we offer a range of shared digital services that is unique in the country. There is no other system in the country that has the same portfolio of services serving the institutions and the state as we have here in Nevada. So I'll explain more as we go, focusing first on some background and then on present and future initiatives. So since you don't know me, oh, sorry, how do I go back? There we go. Um, since you don't know me, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit also. I am the Chief Information Officer for ENSHI, and I oversee um, SCS for approximately the last four years. I also worked in the Wisconsin system and in the Montana system in CIO and related roles. 
with over 16 or 17 years of experience in higher ed information and technology, plus experience in consulting and Fortune 100s prior to that. Uh, my doctoral research was in higher education administration where I compared corporate organizations with academic institutions, seeing how they prioritize resources in response to changes in the environment, such as in the economy or the industry or the markets. And then through that research, I developed new theories around transformational success for higher ed institutions. So back in 1995, um, it used to be that NSHE, or that, sorry, that SCS served just the NSHE institutions, but in 1995, the Nevada legislature charged SCS in service to the state. And we run the statewide research and education network for the state of Nevada. And we've done this for almost 30 years. Um, in general terms, NDOT, the Department of Transportation, provides the fiber. EATS, their IT um, agent uh, department, provides the equipment funding. And SCS runs the statewide network. This arrangement we affectionately refer to as the Three Amigos. And it has saved the state and NSHE millions of dollars through this arrangement. And again, it is unique in the country. So this is a list of services that we provide. And as you see, the three services there that touch the Board of Regents and the system administration are a tip of the iceberg of all the things that we do for the institutions and the state. So the value that we bring, we focus on services that achieve economies at scale. So services that would cost far more for the institutions or the state to provide for themselves. If, it would, if they were to independently replicate these services, it would increase the total cost by approximately tenfold. Um, and this eye chart is simply to illustrate two things. One, we provide a long list of services to the ENSHE institutions. And two, those services are opt-in. If you look at the list, you'll see that sometimes all institutions are taking advantage of that service, and sometimes only a few are. They choose SCS services when it is most cost-effective for them compared to the alternatives, and they often choose differently depending on their needs. So shared digital services to the state of Nevada. This is primarily through what we call NevadaNet, that is the state uh, research and education network. Most states have some form of Nevada net called after their own state. Um, and But much of this is not known to the public. And for example, some things that run on the Nevada net, one of my favorite examples are the bubble boards. They're called intelligent traffic signs, but we know of them as, as bubble boards. Those things on the, the boards on the highway that tell you about the road conditions and missing person alerts, those are all running on Nevada Net. We helped to install them, and SCS both maintains and protects them as device endpoints on the network. In a little more detail, we serve not only the NSHE institutions, but also most of the K-12s, rural health care, and a very long list of state agencies. Again, because of the Three Amigos arrangement, we run the network traffic on the NDOT fiber. This saves NSHE annually millions of dollars in leased circuit costs because we run, and it's just, yes, it's a written agreement, uh, recently written, but it's mostly been handshakes for years, and it's worked. Where NDOT lays the fiber, they give us some strands of fiber, we can run NSHE traffic on the fiber free of cost, and we run the network for them. Here is an overview of some of the network customers that are on Nevada Net. There is a more extensive, complete list on our website and also in our strategic um, planning materials. There are printed versions in the lobby. All the stuff that, all the information that's in the printed versions is also available on the website. It's just formatted so that you have handy little handouts that you can take with you. They're really pretty and in full color. Um, so I do encourage you to pick those up. So we deliver internet and video conferencing. And when I say we deliver the internet, if you imagine at your home, that you have Cox Communications or Spectrum or something, and there's a router that they gave you, and it sits in your house, and you connect to it. And then that's how you get 
to the internet. And they provide a lot of services that is all going on behind the scenes that allows you access to the internet. We are the internet service provider for the K-12s. Also, we provide healthcare access, distance education, and, and um, access to video conferencing and education for the Department of Corrections. So now all of the parole board hearings, court hearings, meetings with attorneys are all handled over video conferencing that's run on SCS. Because of SCS services, NDOC no longer needs to transport inmates to their meetings. So this not only saves them money, but also reduces risk quite a lot. I'd like to point out also that um, we are now serving public libraries. So we are going around the state bit by bit and adding public libraries to the network when it will save them money, if it makes sense for them. This is a list of the organizations currently that use our video conferencing services. I'll point out most of them probably don't understand that SCS is providing that service. I mean, who cares, right? You click the button, you want the thing to come on. They might know that it's SCS, but they probably don't know that SCS is part of ENSHI. So we're doing a lot of work for the state and the state and these agencies are largely unaware of it. Information systems, and this is one of the most important and highest risk system that we run. All of the information systems for the institutions run on, on SCS services. Without that information system, those institutions cannot operate except what they can do with paper and pencil. They cannot admit or enroll students. They wouldn't be able to collect tuition, process financial aid, award scholarships, record grades, produce transcripts, graduate students, make bank transfers, pay the IRS. They couldn't do that without the information system. It's extremely important that it is running 24 seven without outages or performance slowdowns. That involves managing risk. And so we are responsible for managing that risk and maintaining the uptime for those um, operating systems. And I'll give you an example, because it costs a lot of money to manage risk and to maintain systems. If you've ever looked at the SCS budget and said, wow, why is that so much, cost so much money? Well, there's all this stuff that we're doing for the state, for the institutions, and we need to keep it current. And I'll give you a really convenient recent example, the Southwest Airlines meltdown, which was attributed to legacy software systems that they had not upgraded because of the allegedly the cost that would have hit the profit and loss statements adversely for the CEO. So I think we can call that false economy. Um, also, we provide cybersecurity support. And as you know, cyber threats are a real and present danger with high consequences, both in terms of cost and reputational harm. We provide security protections for the institutions and for the state, and we collaborate with law enforcement, state, local, and federal agencies. It becomes more and more challenging every day. Now, cybersecurity is backed by organized crime and, not, and hostile nation states. You can order up a cyber attack and pay for it with a credit card. Cyber threats have a secondary market. So they've really become their own industry. And you can hire subcontractors. You can hire, you can, it's, it's an, an industry unto itself. And higher ed is particularly vulnerable. We are a preferred target for cyber threats because we're sitting on a gold mine of information both student information, financial information, research information, and um, we are not top-down controlled the way private sector is. Uh, we like sometimes to talk about how the rules make us feel more than actually like having to follow a lot of rules. Um, so, and also with the Internet of Things expansion, um, that increases the vulnerability of entry points. And another example, recently a casino had a large data breach and they, they, the hackers got in through the fish tank. There was a smart fish tank that was not secured, and that's how the hackers got into the network. So that's a new one. Uh, our most popular service for the institutions is to negotiate and procure large contracts um, on their behalf. By doing so, we leverage collective buying power, we save the institution's cash outlay, and we also save them a lot of redundant effort by doing it collectively. But that's not all. Now I'm gonna talk about some of our um, new and emerging uh, services that we're doing and fun projects. 
So we are partnering with the state uh, on their broadband expansion to bring broadband out to the underserved areas. We, in, in conjunction with them, we were, they awarded us $16 million of their ARPA funds um, to help them with that. We're adding about 250 new sites to the current network, which has about 300 sites. So we're adding almost doubling the size of the network that we're running on behalf of the state. We're also taking on management of the middle mile, um, which I won't go into definitions there, but it's a chunk of network management that we have not done before. We have the expertise to do it, and the state needs that in order to qualify for grants. So we will be doing that for them. And we continually evolve and change our organization to meet new opportunities as they uh, come about. So research um, engineering is also a new set of services that we've started within the last year. And we have approximately right now $22 million in grant-funded research engineering projects that our research team is delivering on. And when you think of research engineering, first of all, think about any kind of research like environmental sciences, which is conducted out in the field and relies on network infrastructure to collect the data. So our research engineering team is literally out in the mountains and the forests and the deserts and the rivers, um, collecting and managing the network to collect the research data on behalf of the researchers, and it runs through the Nevada net. This saves the researchers having to go out into the field to collect data and um, eliminates the risk of failure of advice to, and losing data that it was storing, for example. And also, um, our research engineering team primarily is supporting right now UNLV and UNR, and, and with some for DRI as well. We're available to help all the institutions as they need uh, more assistance with research as they grow into that space. And I want to point out as part of that, we are the state connector to the global research and education network, which is called Internet2 or I2. Every state has a connector, and we are the state connector to I2. So we connect the institutions to this exclusive REN, it's called a research and education network that is segregated from all of the commodity traffic like Amazon shopping or whatever everybody else is doing. And as that state connector, we are able to provide access to this high-speed network. We're able to provide it to any entity in the state that has either a public sector research or education component to their mission, which is why we're now able to bring public libraries onto the network. And we are able to offer services that are only available through the connector. Uh, one of the new services we'll be offering is assisting um, entities across the state with bringing up Edgerum for their, uh, it's a, I won't go into Edgerum because I'm almost out of time, but um, that's another thing. We're, we're always bringing up new services that serve NSHE and the state. So let me just leave you with these key takeaways. First of all, um, SCS serves where economies of scale can be realized to support the institutions in the state. Economies of scale are usually not visible, and many people are not aware of what we do, including the occasional NG critic. As a shared service digital services organization in a higher ed system, the SCS portfolio is unique across the country. You cannot compare this set of services with any other system in the country. And all the goals of ENSHI are enabled by technology. S access, student success, closing the achievement gap, workforce development, and research cannot move the needle without SCS services. But in conclusion, the two important things I really want you to remember, um, I'm mixing my military metaphors here, but if you could just remember that SCS flies under the radar and SCS raises all boats. So we fly under the radar and we raise all boats. Boats. Thank you for this opportunity to tell the story of the unsung heroes of NG. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much. We, we certainly appreciate the uh, expediency in which you gave us this presentation. Thank you. There is a question, um, Vice Chair Arascata. And the expediency was well, well received, actually. However, uh, I want to pump the brakes on that speed in which we're flying through this. On page 23, if you can go down just a couple pages. Page 23 is the funding sources. I think it's imperative to have transparency on this to 
identify where the trans where the funding sources truly come from. Thank you. So that was a, a comment more than a question. I'm sorry. Will you please oh. provide the funding sources in order to have the greatest success for SES and what you've provided for the entire state of Nevada? Sure. Thank you very much for the question, Ann Milkovich, um, for the record. And so on a slide further down, and I, it looks like it's 23 in the slide deck, um, this is a list of our funding sources and the, the approximate distribution of where that money comes from. So most of our money comes from the state. We also receive some chargeback from the Department of Corrections in particular, and then, um, and then the institutions contribute funding to pay for um, uh, their portion of, say, the information systems. And then randomly, we receive money from the state for projects involving the network. One more question. Mm -hmm. Approximately how many staff members do you have right now with SCS, or how many employees are with SCS? Um, thank you for the question. We have approximately 85 positions. How many do you have open? Um, you know, I, I think we only have a couple open right now. There are a couple that we are planning to open, but I think right now we just filled two. Generally, we usually have two to four, you know, open at any given time, but we have very good uh, success so far with filling vacancies, particularly um, um, with employees from other institutions in NG who like to work for us. <laughs> you all do a great job. Don't ever think you fly that far into the radar. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question from Regent Brown. Thank you. Um, real quick, I missed it. The third amigo. We have NDOT, Fiber, SES Network. EATS. So the Enterprise IT Services, it's their the state IT department, mm -hmm. and they provide a lot of funding for us when we're like expanding the network or something. They'll pay for the equipment, for example. Wow. Wonderful. Thank um, you. Thank you for that. Um, so I think it's amazing and I really do appreciate you giving me, or us, sorry, us a, a rundown of all of the areas that you guys touch because like I had mentioned earlier in the meeting, I've looked at past budgets. The last budget I looked at was 2019. I think you guys had a budget of like 18.7 from NG million, of which you had 98 employees, which equaled somewhere in the ballpark of like 11.6 million in payroll and um, fringe. Um, and I, my big question was like, what are we doing here, right? And so it's really awesome to see that. Uh, but I wanted to just ask, like in your professional opinion, are we're saving that much money doing all of these other, uh, providing all these services to all these other entities where we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna have to pay these pensions. We're gonna have to pay things down the road. Collectively, like this is this is saving us money, hiring all of these employees under SES and coming from the NC budget. Um, thank you for the question, Regent Brown and Ann Milkovich for the record. Absolutely. I, I mean, for the institutions, imagine an information system is an enormous um, system to run, whether you've got 10,000 students or 100,000 students, you have to run the whole thing. For the institutions to do them themselves, they would have to replicate that. So you just multiplied it by eight times. Um, same with the state. And, and the amount of money that we save and um, by working with the state and doing the work for them, um, yes, it's saving millions and millions of dollars. And I think it would quickly come up to 18 million if we sat and added it all up. Okay, yeah, I and I just appreciate that because obviously the eight should be under one roof and if we handled all of that, but then adding in all these other services, I didn't know if that became unmanageable to where we're, we're paying more than we're getting out of it. But obviously with the fiber that we're getting from NDOT and the potential funding and everything else, obviously there's, there's I can see where it would work there. Um, my quick follow-up, if that's okay. Um, is there a second system in the state? I didn't see every agency owned by Nevada, run by Nevada, listed in your thing. And obviously, we'd be here all day if we went through all of them. But is there a second system that's providing these services to the parts of the Nevada government that weren't listed here, that, that we don't, or do we control everything in Nevada? It all runs through our, this budget. 
Um, thank you for the question, Ann Milkovich, again, for the record. If I understand your question correctly, when I say system, I'm referring to the higher ed system, and there is only one in the state of Nevada. Now, other organizations are running their networks, so, but we're running the wide area network, which is the backbone through Nevada and um, out to many of the sites. I'm, I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly. So if that didn't answer it, could you please try me again? Yeah, I apologize. Is there a different, I was scrolling through your slides to get the actual verbiage. Is there a different internet and video conferencing service? Are there different customers that, um, is there a secondary service in the state? So I don't know, is the legislature, well, we have legislative committees in here. I see uh, GoEd in here, but like GoIn isn't listed. Do they use a different system? And where I'm getting at is if we're already spending all this money, uh, we have 98 plus employees that we're paying for, would it be worthwhile looking if there is a secondary system to bring them all within one roof instead of having two competing systems statewide? Or, or did we just not list every function in the slide? Um, thank you again. I'm sure we might have missed some functions somewhere, but many of the state agencies are using their own video conferencing systems. I mean, Zoom like really took off in the pandemic years. And, and so we're not attempting to consolidate, okay. certainly open to those conversations, if it makes sense for people. Uh, one of my favorite mantras about shared services, if you want to go far, go together. If you want to go fast, go alone. It's not... Um, there are drawbacks to running, to sharing systems, because then you sometimes have to wait in line for what you want. It's not always, consolidation is not always more efficient or better, but we're certainly open to all of those conversations. I will also speak to the headcount. Um, SCS used to have over 120 employees, and we're now down to 85. We're at our lowest headcount that we've ever been and we continue to operate more efficiently and repurpose positions as times change so that we can continue to evolve, meet new opportunities, provide better services, and do it as efficiently as possible. I'll just say as a closing comment, I, it might completely be out of my realm or scope, but if there is opportunities to consolidate and there's always dangers of one thing and what if that goes down, you know, you always want to have a backup, but if there's a way to save the state money and then we get a little bit more money in our budget to cover these things, I would be interested in, in learning more at a later date. Thank, um, you. thank you for that, Regent Brown. Thank you. Uh, Regent McMichael has a question. Yes, for the record, uh, Donald Sobante McMichael Sr. Uh, my question is, uh, as we're expanding broadband up north as quickly as we can, are we able to take advantage of the uh, federal government uh, discounts that are provided to uh, uh, network providers? Uh, yes, thank you for the for the question, Regent McMichael and Milkovich again. And yes, we are working through the state. So the federal money is awarded to the state and then the state is distributing it, it to us according to how we are participating and contributing to that. So yes, we are receiving federal grant funds for broadband expansion by way of the state. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, follow up. Um, are we able to uh, alert our students and their families of the uh, affordability uh, of, I'm sorry, the affordable connectivity program that the federal government uh, is assisting for discounted uh, internet? Um, thank you again for the question. And in terms of we, we SCS don't, interact with the students. We don't have students. The, the students work through the institutions. So the institutions take care of the students. We take care of the institutions. I imagine that the institutions are working with their students on those opportunities, but that, that's out of our scope. Um, but who would notify uh, from the system that uh, these uh, discounts are available? Uh, they have to apply for them. Uh, so I would like to know uh, what agency within our system um, looks at certain areas of broadband and say, uh, the federal government is going to give you $30 off your internet service from the uh, internet providers that you have. 
if you apply. Uh, there are qualifications uh, such as low income, WIC, uh, SNAP. Uh, those are programs that the government says will qualify you for these discounts. I'm just trying to figure out, is there a way for the system to alert uh, the families and students that these are available for them. I mean, $30 is, is, a, is a good savings for internet service. And if we don't reach out to the students to let them know or to their families, um, they're missing out on a great opportunity. Thank you, Regent McMichael. I can certainly inquire with the institutions um, what they're doing. I'm not sure whether this would be through the CIOs or possibly, probably through student services, but I can reach out and find out that information for you if you would like. Thank you. Regent Boylan has a question. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Milkovich, it's so grand to see you again after the last time you gave us a pre presentation or told us about things because I see a lot of more money coming in. My question is, uh, when was the last time, and no technical terms here, when was the last time some black hats tried to get into our system and do something bad? I'm just using simple terms. And uh, how do we get notified about something like that besides the system going down? That's just, I think you understand what I'm saying mm -hmm. in a very simple way. Yes, thank yes, you, Regent Boylan and Milkovich, for the record. Um, we're under attack thousands of times a day. Sure. So um, they don't get through. We are monitoring the network. We are monitoring the systems, collecting data um, co continuously. So in terms of the number of attacks, it's, it's thousands a day. Uh, but so far, I, I, we have not experienced any breaches, serious breaches or attacks that we have That's not right. been able to deflect, All right. um, at least since I've been here in four and a half years. I was more concerned with foreign black hats doing it. That's, you know, if there have been any breaches, you said none. So that's, that's it. Thank you. Correct. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. And Regent Perkins has a question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. More, more of a comment, if I may, to um, piggyback on what Regent Brown was saying. A lot of uh, places in the state don't even know about us. So I guess our uh, duty as regents, we should be out there telling people the services, the wonderful services and very in-depth services that SCS does. I remember having the same conversation with GoEd when they were looking for some uh, internet uh, services, and I immediately... <laughs> I bug, I bug Dr. Ann a lot. I'm like, have you, have you heard of this? Have you heard of that? Are you on, on, on top of this? And 99% of the time, she is. So just singing accolades to SCS. <laughs> Thank you, Regent. Are there any more questions or comments? Thank you very much for the presentation and your time. Thank you. Um, next, we are going to hear from our interim chief of staff to the board, Carrie Nikolajewski. Good afternoon, Regents. Carrie Nikolajewski, Interim Chief of Staff for the record, and I'm going to speak to you today about your board office. This board is a member of the Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges, and they have a really interesting publication entitled The Role of a Board Professional. And I wanted to select this quote from that presentation because I think it succinctly states what our function is and where we sit within the organization. And it also speaks to the under the radar nature of our work. A former chair once described what we do in the board office as shoveling snow during a snowstorm. It might be difficult to recognize the work that's being done and the impact that it's having, but if we stopped shoveling, you would certainly notice. Not the best reference for Las Vegas, but those of you from the North understand. <clears throat> this is your current staffing in your board office. Um, there are four employees, and it is with great pride that I call your attention to the banner at the bottom of the slide. 
because among the four of us, we have 48 years combined experience serving this, this board, not any board, this board. Angela Palmer came in 1999. So she saw this board through Y2K. And if you think about that, you realize how long ago that was. And if you look at the um, number of years that we have served just ENSHI in general, no matter what position we've been, we were in, that number increases to 60 years. So there is a tremendous depth of experience and institutional knowledge in your board office. Two primary objectives of our staff, and these are of equal importance to us. The first is really our obligation to you, which is to make sure that you have the information and the tools and the environment necessary to carry out your duties. And the second is really your obligation to the public to do your business transparently and accessibly, and we facilitate that on your behalf. Looking at some of the core responsibilities, um, I broke these into four categories. The first is planning and executing the business of the board. And I'm not gonna talk about everything that's there, but um, just the first item in particular, establishing a work plan. Your policies dictate that certain items come to you at certain times of the year. Um, there's also things that aren't in policy but are more procedure, like the institutional metrics reports that, that come quarterly. So I have a work plan, and on a quarterly basis, I meet with the chair of the board and the vice chair and the chancellor, and we talk about that work plan ahead of the quarterly meeting, and we sort of get our arms around everything that is going to be coming forward. Um, that It's a living document, so it changes throughout the year. Another obviously important task is preparing your agendas and your reference material. You heard from the chief deputy attorney general this morning. There's a lot that goes into that. We don't ever want to publish an agenda that's going to limit what you can do during a meeting or do something where your action is not going to be legitimate following the meeting. One other important thing on this list is the codifying of your policies. Um, that's obviously something that's really important, not just to the system, but to the institutions because they reference the handbook and the procedures and guidelines manual on a regular basis. And one of the great things about our processes here is we have in the board office historical versions of those documents. So if someone needed to know what a policy looked like 10 years ago, we could pull that and, and show you exactly what it was. Recording and documenting board actions, it's pretty self-explanatory. A lot of these things are required uh, by law. But I do want to call your attention to the online archive because it's pretty cool if you're a nerd like I am. Um, there's content that dates back to 1865, the activities of this board. The records are searchable. They are referenced a lot, not just by the board office, um, but by the system office and the institutions and maybe even sometimes the regions, I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> but it's a really helpful resource and we maintain that in the board office. Facilitating communication and the exchange of information. You all get a lot of emails from me and my office. Sometimes they are strictly board business. Sometimes I'm just a pass-through. I'm sharing in reports from system administration um, or the institutions, uh, regent requests. Those responses typically come through my office. Communicating in several directions. A cool thing about the board office is we touch every corner of the system and we communicate up and down side to side. So governing board, presidents, VPs, deans, chancellor, cabinet, um, faculty, staff, students, public. We talk to everyone. We are your, often your face when someone is reaching out to this board. Working closely with board and system leadership, very important. Um, I have wonderful relationships with each of the regents, um, always my chair and the chancellor. Regent services and support. You all are very busy, very engaged. The board has a lot of meetings. You travel to a lot of campus events. Um, that's a big part of what we do for you. 
Um, there's lots of other items there. Basically just um, our service, our service and support for your activities. And this is my last slide. This was sort of an interesting exercise for me to try to quantify some of the things that we do um, throughout the year for you. Um, obviously the pages of reference material is the big number there. Uh, but I will say that this is not just accomplishment of the board office. This is an accomplishment of the board because we are so connected and we move forward together that all of this stuff is for both of us. So I would say, um, great job to my team and to you. And that is all I have. Thank you very much, Carrie, for the presentation. Are there any regents that have questions or comments? I have. I want to uh, thank the staff uh, for everything that they do for us. I know it seemed like a small thing to want to call in and make arrangements for travel, um, but the staff is always out there 100% uh, for each of us as regents to make sure that what we need to get done is done in a timely manner, and I very much appreciate them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Sure, Regent Brown. Um, thank you so much for uh, coming up there. Is there any way we could, because I feel like I've been, I'll call Winter when I shouldn't, I call Juliana when I shouldn't. Is there like a key of like, if this is what you need, this is your first POC, come to any of us, but is there a key for that just as we get warmed up? I will certainly send you something and share it with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so that would be all of the information for system administration areas of responsibility. Thank you all very much for providing us that information, all of your presentations. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, the chancellor who has uh, comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Dale Urquiaga, Acting Chancellor. Um, I just wanted to sort of wrap up this section um, before you move on with your minutes. So um, listen, uh, chancellors come and go, sometimes here like Alice in Wonderland, very quickly. Um, the folks that you've just heard from are the backbone of the system administration that manages that $2 billion entity you have heard about. You tend to see us a lot. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. Sometimes you ask us a lot of questions that really are th about things that are happening in the institutions. But I just wanted to, particularly for the new regents, give you that context. There's 150 to 160 people in that system administration, system computing services world that sits atop that 15,000 employee um, enterprise with a $2 billion budget for which you are the fiduciaries. So I, as someone who's only been here six months, I want to stress to you what a good team you have in that SASCS world. You haven't even scratched the surface today. We have not in what you have out in the eight institutions. But what we've tried to give you in these presentations and I appreciate my team and I appreciate my partners, Carrie and Joe, in their roles here with, with us in system administration that we give you kind of this overview so you understand the apparatus that most immediately serves you in trying to manage uh, what goes on in the aid institutions. Over the course of a year, you will see metrics reports and data and budgets and lots and lots of policies and lots and lots of students up from the aid institutions. Everything from research to um, you will actually see the faculty and the students in your meetings. So this, while you'll see us kind of always operating with you, this is um, just the surface of what your jobs are like. Um, and I, so I just wanted to sort of remind you of that. It Sometimes it feels when you're on the receiving end of this that we're your um, go-to answers and also your whipping boys. Um, there are a lot of other people out there in the organization who do um, good work. Uh, and so um, uh, as somebody who has only been here a short time, keep that perspective. There are lots of people in this organization. Um, and then again, I would just say to you as the person who, who has the privilege of working with this team that you just saw, 
um, you really are well served and they will be here and many have been here as you've heard for a very long time and um, that is in your best interest um, because you too like chancellors come and go and the continuity of an organization that is approaching its sesquicentennial um, is about the people um, who you just saw. So two things. Um, thank them on your way out. And remember that they are just the uh, front piece of this giant organization, which you will see sort of revealed to you over, over this next year. Um, so thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the um, indulgence. Thank you for your comments. We appreciate um, that. I'm sure uh, staff does as well. What I'd like to do is move to uh, agenda number five. And what this is, is a consideration of approval for minutes that were part of um, ad hoc committees and special meetings. Um, you'll see by the agenda, these meetings took place in, in September and October, and then in November. Um, is there a motion to I approve? Need to approve. Motion to approve from Regent Perkins. Is there a, a second from Regent McMichael? So we, we have the motion and the second to approve the meeting minutes. Is there any discussion? I can apply the path. Gracious. Susan Brager, for the record, should the four new regents be voting on this? I'm going to defer to uh, Jimmy Martinez so that you have legal clarification, um, but I would, I, I'm going to say yes based on my experience, but. Okay. I just, some, every board's different, so. Yeah. Jimmy Martinez, for the record, um, I, I believe you can vote on it if there's anything that you see in there that's, that you believe is incorrect for some reason, um, you can bring that up, but yeah. Did that answer your question, Regent Breger? It did. I have not looked at all that, so I would just be doing a blind vote, which doesn't seem right. But to, to have it be successful and people have left, you couldn't get to that number eight. So I guess you would need us. Okay. <laughs> then I will do that with that explanation. Is there any more discussion? Okay. So I don't see any more discussion. So that I'm sorry, Regent Goodman, go ahead. Are you going to call for abstentions on this? Um, I did not plan on calling for okay. abstentions on I mean, this, we, but you if certainly. If we're silent, we can, then then it, it, it's not an abstention. You know what I mean? So I, I don't feel comfortable voting on minutes I haven't reviewed. Okay. But yeah. So. That that's okay. Thanks. Um, so the 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 motion and the second then is to approve the adoption um, of the minutes. Those in favor, please say either aye or yes. Aye. 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 The, those who are opposed, say no or nay. I believe that this is going to pass, but because of the silence and the small minority of yeas, I'm going to defer to our Deputy Attorney General who just heard this vote. Uh, Rosalie Bordelow, for the record. So for purposes of minutes, and we get this question sometimes, um, if you weren't present, you can still vote because what you're voting to do is say, we are making these our official minutes. Um, there have been disclosures that there were some individuals who weren't present. Um, for your purposes today, you need your majority to pass something. So I believe we had at least our seven Yeses. And so um, if for purposes of this vote, an abstention is counted as a no, but as long as you have your seven yeses, then I think we're good to go. Well, you think we'll, we don't have, we don't have seven? I, it, I, I believe it might be, a, this is Chair Brooks, for the record, I believe it might be appropriate to go to a roll call vote so that we can be certain yeah. um, of, of the yeas and the nays. So I will ask Carrie to do a roll call vote. Again, this is... Um, the motion and the second is to adopt approval of the meeting minutes. And after just one qualifier, so everybody is also aware, there are requirements in the OML that um, minutes are approved within 45 days or the next meeting of the public body, whichever comes later, unless good cause is shown. But because we are now here at this meeting, there could be consequences for tabling. So I just want to make sure everyone's aware of that. Thank you. 
Regent Perkins. Aye. Regent Tarkanian. She, she's, she's a oh. Vice Chair Arascada is absent. Regent Boylan. Aye. Regent Breger. I said aye. I'll vote aye with the uh, comments that I made earlier. Thank you. Chair Brooks. Yes. Regent Brown. Yes, with similar comments as Regent Brager. Thank you. Regent Carvalho. Aye. Regent Cruz Crawford. Aye. Regent Del Carlo. Absent. Regent Downs. Absent. Regent Goodman. Aye, with acknowledgement of my previous comments. Thank you. Thank you. Regent McMichael. Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. So the motion did pass. Now we move to agenda item number six, new business. Does any regent have new business? Uh, yes, chair, Mr. Chair, I do, but I'm not first. Somebody else. Okay. I saw <laughs> Regent Carvalho um, and then Regent Perkins. Is there anybody on this side? Yeah. Regent Boylan and then Regent Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate to say that that these are um, items of new business from uh, Regent Del Carlo. If that's if that's not appropriate, then they can just come from me. Either way, for the record, um, the first is review of existing committees to add a Board of Regents Governance or Development Committee. Um, and number two, um, in the absence of the Board of Regents' own legal counsel. Who has the ultimate authority or decision um, for uh, representing the board? The Chancellor's General Counsel or the Attorney General's Office Representative? That one may be more of a regent request, um, but I do believe she would, she would like to have that conversation in a meeting. So I'll just put that out there. Thank you. Regent Perkins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to uh, have on a future agenda uh, perhaps forming an ad hoc committee to find some uh, a, re a recruitment for the chief general, no, not chief general counsel, sorry, um, <laughs> the, spe the special counsel and slash um, chief of staff for the board. Okay, thank you, Regent Perkins. Regent Boylan? You know, I think she beat me to it. I was going to ask that we start an immediate search for the, chair, the, the board counsel and uh, chief of staff. That's an important position, and I think we can uh, hope that it comes up soon and in the next uh, meeting. If not, um, and I'm going back to what uh, Ms. Bordelov said about discussion and debate. Can we discuss it now? We're not debating. Uh, you can discuss it. So that was my first question earlier. You remember it was like, why are yeah. we not allowed to discuss things? Rosalie can Bordelov, we, for yes, the record, you can enter into some discussion here, but deliberation as to what exactly, for example, the actual creation of a committee and anything surrounding who's on that committee would have to happen at your later time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Regent Boylan. Regent Brown? Um, for a short callback to my question uh, with CFO Klinger, um, I've looked at budgets and I'm just kind of digging into this audit report. And um, I do have some concerns with some of the expenditure transfers between state and non-state accounts, reporting, oversight, things like that. Um, I'd like to be able to dig in a little bit more. I know we have this meeting on the 18th, so next Wednesday, uh, but it's for information only. So, and that prevents us from taking any type of official action on how to address these things. I think collectively as a board, we've all said that we want more transparency and more, um, you know, change in this. And if we can't actually take any change or take any action, I think we kind of handcuff ourselves. So I don't really know the proper way of doing it, but I would like to move to making that a actionable item for the 18th agenda and not just information. Okay. Thank you, Regent Brown. Any other new business? We will move right to public comment then. Is there any public comment in Elko? No public comment in Elko. Is there any public comment in Reno? 
Yes, there is. Kent Irvin, State President, Nevada Faculty Alliance. For the record, my name is spelled K-E-N-T-E-R-V-I-N. Good afternoon. Again, I would like to welcome the new regents to the board. Each of you, new or continuing, brings a unique set of experience and skills to the board, and I have no timer on screen. The legislative audits of NSHE were reported yesterday. I hope you all have copies by now. The audits raised serious concerns about expenditure transfers between state and non-state accounts, reporting, and insufficient oversight by the board. At best, there are, has been sloppiness, non-uniformity between institutions, and vague policies at the system level. At worst, some, some institutions may have skirted state law. Holding institutions accountable is the board's fiduciary duty. The special meeting called for January 18th to discuss the audits is now agendized as information only. That will prevent you as the board from taking official action on how to address the issues and to publicly show your intent for policy changes and action. But any of three of you can request, now two more, that the agenda for January 18th be changed to an action item and that the agenda be reposted in time for the three-day uh, posting requirement. The board should be able to take action to direct the chancellor to take action or to bring back new policies or just to approve or not approve the report and the auditor's recommendations. That would show that you take your fiduciary duties seriously and that you take the legislative audit seriously. Thank you and have a great holiday weekend while we celebrate the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. Is there any additional public comment in Reno? There is no further. Is there any public comment in Las Vegas? Regent Goodman? I do have public comment. I just want to uh, thank, thank all of you just publicly. This was just a wonderful presentation today. I learned so much and um, I'm just grateful for your service. I'm very excited to work with uh, such professionals and I think it's going to be a, a, a great term and I, I look forward to working with all of you, all the regents as well as um, all the staff. I'm very excited. Regent Breger. Thank you, and um, Regent Goodman said exactly what I wanted to say. It was the afternoon, not that the morning wasn't good, but this was my 25th time over her third, no, third time. It was all very, very good, but the <laughs> afternoon was extraordinary. I mean, it really helped put things into place of what, how, and where, and I appreciate that. Is there any additional public comment in Las Vegas? Seeing that there is no additional public comment, uh, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>